on Mayor Tory to come forward for the presentation. Thank you very much, Speaker, and good morning to uh, Council colleagues. And it's just such a, such a source of great pride to have uh, with us this morning some of the athletes uh, from the GTA, uh, some of whom have moved here to do their training. And uh, I was asking them how they're liking living in Toronto. Unfortunately, they got positive uh, reviews from most of them, which we're always happy to hear. But I'm so happy they could be here at City Council today. Uh, and they're joined by David Schumacher, the CEO of the Canadian Olympic uh, Committee, and Jennifer Dwyer, who's also with the Canadian Olympic Committee. And, uh, they were telling me, and I'm, I'm happy about this too, that we sent, uh, we all did, sent a letter to them which was posted in the Athletes' Village uh, wishing them good luck, those who were athletes from the GTA, and this was a source of some envy uh, on the part of other athletes from other cities in Canada who weren't uh, receiving the same uh, encouragement from uh, their host uh, city. And so uh, we're today celebrating and recognizing the athletes who complete, competed in the Pan and Parapan American Games in Lima, Peru. Um, and it's no small feat, of course, to make it uh, to the Pan Am and Parapan uh, Games. And we all remember, I think, with such incredible excitement, actually having an opportunity to see not only our own athletes in action here in Toronto in 2015, the preceding games, but also to see other athletes from around the world, to see the level of competition that was um, represented by those games we had here in Toronto, and I'm sure that level of uh, competition was uh, matched by what went on in Peru. And so, on your behalf, I want to offer our congratulations to the athletes, and I'll introduce them by name in a moment, um, for their incredible hard work. Most of them were telling me just when we were chatting before we uh, convened this meeting that they, of course, devote themselves full time uh, to training uh, and to preparing for these games, uh, and uh, it is something that um, is, I think, a real testament to their determination and their discipline uh, that they do that and that they've achieved the level of excellence that they have. Um, these men and women who are here with us in the chamber today are all uh, people who are from uh, our great city. They are heroes who inspired us and who continue to inspire us through their athleticism um, and their great sportsmanship uh, during the games before and after. And I think we're really lucky to have uh, people like this uh, who represent us, uh, represent our country and represent our city so well. And it's a real honor to have uh, all of you here today uh, to be uh, with us. Uh, these athletes had to travel a long way and they told me that in Lima, on top of everything else, it was really cold uh, un unexpectedly and that uh, they had the good fortune through the Olympic Committee of having a thousand sets of red mittens uh, that they were able to uh, put on to all of our athletes, or a thousand mittens, and uh, they were able to wear those and a lot of uh, the athletes were jealous about that too. May I maybe just ask that uh, the, and we've got some medals that are on display here uh, from uh, some of the athletes that are here. And I'll just ask if they could stand up when I mention their names, just so that you could recognize uh, them uh, one, one uh, and the sports that they uh, represented us and competed on our behalf. Uh, AJ Asadian, Taekwondo. <laughs> Javon Balfour, Wrestling. Sarah Douglas, Sailing. Crispin Duenas, Archery. Natalie Garcia, Gymnastics. Justin Karstad, Gymnastics. Pierce Lepage, Decathlon. Catherine Yoshida, Gymnastics. Brian Yang, Badminton. Um, Jessica Guo, Fencing. And from our Paralympic wheelchair basketball team, Robert Bo Hedges, who's right here up to beside me. So to you all, um, uh, congratulations and thank you for representing us so well, representing not just our country, but we're proud that you represented our city. And we hope you all continue to live here uh, and continue to uh, bless us with your talent and invite your friends to come here too, because we want as many great athletes to live here as possible. And we are very much aware of the contribution that you make, that sports makes, that athletics makes to uh, a healthy and vibrant uh, city. So thank you very much. Now, does anybody want to say a word uh, here? Or, uh, nobody was prepared to do that. I wanted to make sure I gave the opportunity. Anybody just dying to make a speech in front of the Toronto City Council? Yeah, that's probably a very sane approach that you're taking. <laughs> thank you very much and congratulations again.
Thank you and congratulations. <clears throat> I will now call for a motion to confirm the minutes. Councilor Layton, you have a motion on the minutes from our last meeting. Already delaying the meeting. That in accordance with section 27-2.10 of council procedures, no, no, city council. No, not that one. Not that one. The yellow. <laughs> that city council confirmed the minutes of city council in the regular meeting held on October 7th. There's two motions in front of me, October 2nd and 3rd, 2019, in the form supplied to the members. The non-controversial one. The non-controversial one. Thank you. All those in favor? Carried. I will now call upon the committee chairs to introduce their reports. The chairs can speak about the reports for up to five minutes. Mayor Tory, you have a motion to introduce the executive committee report. Thank you, Speaker. I move that report from meeting nine of the executive committee listed on the agenda of council be presented uh, for consideration. This was, uh, Speaker, a, a very important uh, meeting. They're all important in the sense of the matters that we deal with, but I think this one was particularly important in that we uh, debated and received a lot of uh, public representation on a major transit agreement that marked one of the most significant steps forward in terms of true cooperation between all three levels of government. And, and of course, it was happening in Toronto City Hall in front of our executive committee, but I think it marks uh, an opportunity where we have the province uh, aligned with a number of things that we want to do uh, together to build the transit in the city and the support uh, of the federal government in uh, that undertaking. As a result of this agreement, if uh, you see fit to approve it over the next uh, day or so, uh, we will have almost $30 billion invested by other governments in Toronto transit expansion. $30 billion invested by other governments in Toronto transit expansion. This in turn will free up uh, up to $5 billion to invest in urgent state of good repair and city priority transit projects, including the Scarborough East, Eglinton East, LRT and waterfront transit. The agreement also ensures that Toronto, the City of Toronto, retains ownership of the existing subway network. There will be no upload and the TTC retains operations of the transit network. The province will also cover sunk costs for transit planning and any cost overruns for the four subway projects that are covered by the agreement. This agreement, I believe, and the Executive Committee concurred in that, is a good deal for the City as a whole and for transit riders in particular. We had more than 60 deputations at the Executive Committee last week, most of whom came to address the local impacts of the proposed Ontario line on their communities. We heard from those residents and from their local councillor, Councillor Fletcher, and in response, we made amendments to this item requesting discussions that we will have on an ongoing basis with Metrolinx and with the province uh, to uh, mitigate the concerns that were raised by the residents. Now, beyond this groundbreaking transit agreement, uh, we also dealt with a major transformation of the city's real estate assets with a program that we've called Modern TO. It's a five-year plan that I'm very hopeful the council will see fit to approve today, and it will lead to $750 million in savings over the next 25 years. Modern TO will reduce the city's office locations from 52 to 20, mainly by doing away with leases that are coming due in the upcoming years. In other words, the lease of outside space by the city. It will unlock eight properties for city building purposes, including a real focus on affordable housing wherever we can. It will maximize the city's key civic centers in Scarborough, in Etobicoke, and in North York, as well as the city hall and metro hall, so that what we will now do is take many of those 20 places where we will no longer lease outside space from private landlords and instead focus on making sure that the space we own can accommodate up to 5,600 more jobs by modernization, by renovation, by updating those buildings, which I think my colleagues will agree, Speaker, are in need of renovation and updating. And this will allow us in turn as well at the same time to have those jobs uh, be more equitably spread through the city as opposed to all being uh, in expensive uh, downtown space. The, uh, the program, when fully implemented, will decrease the city's overall footprint in terms of office space by 25%. And this is the kind of thing that I think people expect
to see this government do at a time of scarce resources. Modern TO is exactly the kind of thing that residents and businesses expecting us to, expect us to do, to modernize our office space, to be consistent with, with what our, others are doing, to make sure that our staff have the best possible circumstances in which to work, and to find ways to do it that also, at one and the same time, achieve efficiency and also create a city building opportunities. So I look forward to the debates on both of these items today, and I will simply say this in concluding in particular on the transit item. I think people should think back to where we were a year ago. Think back to where we were a year ago, where we had a government that was committed at that time and was taking legislative steps to begin to upload the subway. They were giving every indication they were going to take arbitrary steps to build projects, whatever our input might have been or might not have been on those projects. They were saying that they were going to require us to make a substantial financial contribution to those projects, which would by then have been uploaded. And there were people here who said, don't go talk to them, don't sit down with them, don't uh, negotiate with them, it's not uh, a prudent thing to do. And we sent our professional public servants, who I want to thank today for the fact that they went to 50 meetings with their counterpart professional public servants from the province, and they've come forward uh, with an agreement that, that I commend to you uh, for approval today uh, that I think is a significant step forward on the thing that we're all elected to do, which is to work with the other governments to try and deal as best we can with the differences that are inevitably going to exist between and among us to get transit built for the people of Toronto. And I think this is a once in a lifetime chance with the three governments all aligned for us to send a signal saying, yes, we're in for this, we want to get this built, we want to move forward, we want to get it done. That's what I think we were sent here to do, I say to you respectfully, and I look forward to the discussion on this matter later today. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Councillor Lai, you have a motion to introduce the Civic Appointments Committee report. Thank you, Speaker, and good morning, everyone. That the report from meeting 10 of the Civic Appointment Committee listed on the agenda of the Council be presented for consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Thompson, you have a motion to introduce the Economic and Community Development Committee report. Uh, yes, good morning, Speaker. That the report from meeting number eight of the Economic and Community Development Committee listed on the agenda of Council be presented for consideration. Um, Madam Speaker, I'd simply like to draw members' attention to two of the specific items that are on the uh, EDC agenda. This is uh, EC 8.6. Uh, strategic Priorities for Cultural Investment 2020 to 2020 to 2024. Um, it really, the report um, basically look at the new uh, strategic priorities that are going to guide the city's investment uh, in the cultural sector for the next uh, five years. Um, the um, proposed prior priorities is um, here to, to, to show what the EDC divisional strategy is in terms of um, what we're going to do. It also talks about um, the opportunities and so on. There's a growing inequality that is being faced in the city with respect to opportunities and, and, ch and challenges and so on. And we need to act boldly. We need to be decisive in terms of how we address uh, some of these particular issues, looking at the, um, the rising uh, property cost that threatens as well to displace Toronto's cultural venues and um, places for artists to, to work. We also need to take a look at uh, Pierce City's um, uh, opportunity in terms of the, um, the opportunity to attract uh, and, and um, to bring more businesses uh, and investment to the city of Toronto, creating this um, vibrancy that we need with respect to our city and so on. We also need to be looking at um, uh, cultural programming and so on in terms of how to ensure the cultural workforce become more inclusive in a very diverse city. Um, these new opportunities uh, and through this particular report are guided basically on three specific um, uh, principles that we're looking at over the next five years. And that is uh, one, culture for all, which is to increase, increase opportunities for all Torontonians, no matter where they live in the city, to participate in local relevant cultural activities throughout the years that reflects uh, Toronto's uh, diversity and creativity. 
Uh, two, space for culture, to maintain and create new accessible, sustainable space for Toronto's creative sector in this growing city. And three, developing um, creative talent to strengthen Toronto's cultural sector workforce and increase, again, diversity. I can't stress that enough. Uh, but of course, diversity with inclusion and the representation in this sector. One thing that's not on the report here, Speaker, that we're actually working on is blockchain. Opportunities for SMEs, small, medium-sized enterprises, that is something that we want to look at. We want to look at creating a center of excellence for blockchain in this city. It's a great opportunity in, in this particular area. The other area, Speaker, that I simply want members to be able to take a look at is uh, EC 8.8, which is a realignment of the two significant uh, cultural grants program. We're looking to see how we can revise this um, cultural grant uh, uh, program as such, uh, you know, the, the museum uh, grants program, to ensure that uh, through these two programs, the transformation that we're talking about in terms of how that can benefit everyone will be addressed. And this is through looking at cultural uh, festival grants, supporting uh, significant festival and other events across the city, we're getting a lot more calls and uh, for assistance by many organizations and group. We know that this is a city where lots of festivals are held during the summer months, particularly in winter months as well, and it benefits this city grace greatly. We're also looking at uh, cultural access and uh, development of program support to ensure that um, cultural programs are able to operate year-round and programming and space for culture and to champion uh, what, is, what is an important sector, the creative talent that exists in the city. So, Speaker, we're looking at all of these initiatives through the, um, uh, the EDC lens, and uh, this will help us creating that vibrant art scene, vibrant cultural scene, and help to create more opportunities uh, in this city to ensure that this city continues to be a livable city and the envy of many uh, around the world. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Ains, do you have a motion to introduce the General Government and Licensing Committee report? Uh, good morning, Madam Speaker. That the report for meeting eight of the General Government Licensing Committee listed on the agenda of Council be presented for consideration. Thank you. Councillor Pasternak, you have a motion to introduce the Infrastructure and Environment Committee report? Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Speaker. That the report for meeting eight of the Infrastructure and Environment Committee listed on the agenda of Council be con presented for consideration. I would just bring your attention to two items, IE 8.5, which, which is an update on flood mitigation and damage repair for Toronto's waterfront and Toronto Island Park, a very important uh, uh, discussion either through uh, climate change or through um, our ability to protect our precious waterfront assets, and IE 8.7, uh, automa automated vehicles. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Bailal, you have a motion to introduce the Planning and Housing Committee report. I do, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Good morning. That the report for meeting nine of the Planning and Housing Committee listed on the agenda of Council be presented for consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Grimes, do you have a motion to introduce the Etobicoke York Community Council report? Yes, and good morning, Madam Speaker. That the report from meeting nine of the Etobicoke York Community Council list on the agenda of Council be presented for consideration. Thank you. Councillor Pasternak, you have a motion to introduce the North York Community Council report? I do. Thank you, Madam Speaker. That the report from meeting nine of the North York Community Council listed on the agenda of Council be presented for consideration. I would also like to add at this time that uh, uh, we are, uh, our thoughts and prayers, I guess, are with uh, Councillor Jay Robinson as she undergoes treatment for, for breast cancer. She will, she's a vital part of North York, and I'm sure all of us agree we want her back here soon with a speedy recovery. Thank you. Councillor Perch, you have a motion to introduce the Toronto and East York Community Council report. Good morning, Speaker. I move that the report from meeting nine of the Toronto East York Community Council listed on the agenda of Council be presented for consideration. Thank you. Councillor Cressy, you have a motion to introduce a new business and business previously requested from the Mayor and City officials. I do, Speaker. That new business and business <coughs> previously requested from the Mayor and City officials listed on the agenda of Council be presented for consideration. 
Thank you. All those in favor of the motions, recorded vote. Councillor Wong Tang, please. The motion carries unanimously, 23 in favor. Are there any declarations of interest? Please indicate the committee, the item or motion number and the nature of the interest. And remember that you must also file a written declaration of your interest with the city clerk. If there is, if you can put your name up, request to question staff. Councilor Wong Tam. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. On page five, uh, EC, uh, 8.8 .8, realignment of two cultural grants programs um, as well as EC 8.6 establishing strategic priorities for cultural investment 2020 to 2024 I am a board member of the Toronto Biannual Arts and in the uh, uh, with uh, with the greatest um, uh, 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 conservation uh, sorry um, uh, uh, sort of mind to uh, to uh, to interest uh, there may be a conflict in the future because it uh, deals with grants Okay, does the staff have that? Did you fill out the form? Okay. I will now call for petitions. Are there any petitions at this time? Councillor Thompson? Uh, thank you, Speaker. I do have one that's on its way. I don't have it just yet, so I'm just wondering if I could just reserve a spot to be able to introduce it at the appropriate time when sure. I receive that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank just, you. Just let me know. Sure, thank you. Thank you. Members, I will now review the order paper. We have three deferred items on the agenda. Uh, PH 8.8 .8, on response to the Auditor General's outstanding recommendation regarding Section 37 and Section 45 funds not received in 2008 and 2017 approvals. NY 8.3 on a final report zoning bylaw amendment application for 1299 Don Mills Road. And NY 8.4 on alterations to a designated heritage property at 1299 Don Mills Road road and authority to enter into a heritage easement agreement. The mayor has designated items EX 9.1 headed Toronto Ontario Transit Update and item EX 9.2 headed Modern TO Citywide Real Estate Strategy and Office Portfolio as is key matters for this meeting. The, uh, these will be the first items of business today. Notices and motions are scheduled to be dealt with at 2 p.m. tomorrow, only if the mayor's key matters are completed. I propose that City Council set a time for a closed session, if required, later in the, in the meeting. The City Clerk has noted the items that members wish to hold. I will now go through the items listed on the order paper to take additional holds. I will recognize requests to make matters urgent and time-specific after I go through the items for additional holds. Once the order paper has been approved by council, any change would need a two-thirds vote. Page three. Deputy Mayor Minimong. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning. Um, I'd like to hold eight, uh, North York 8.3 and 8.4. Um, staff are preparing a supplementary report that should be ready tomorrow. Okay. Page four. Councillor Bailo. Um, I would like to ha uh, hold EX 9.5, Implementing Strategy uh, for the Parks and Recreation Facilities. Okay. And uh, EX 9.10, uh, Saving at Risk Affordable Housing Units, Tippett Road. 
Thank you. Councillor Cressy. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, on page four, I can actually release item EX 9.6 and EX 9.7. Okay, so on page four, Councillor Cressy is received. Uh, nice ring. Just don't get this on the show. My mic is on. I was ready to sing it. Sorry. So <laughs> on page four, Councillor Cressy is releasing the EX 9.6. All in favor? Carried. On page four, EX 9.7. Councillor Cressy is releasing. All in favor? Carried. Councillor Matlow, on page four. I apologize to you, Madam Speaker. I missed an item on page three. Um, just the top of the page, PH 8.8. 8.8? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Page five. Councillor Wong Tam. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. On, on page 5, EC 8.5, resourcing the Regent Park Social Development Plan. I don't need to hold the matter, but I am asking for a recorded vote. Okay, so we'll do that now. On page 5, EC 8.5, Councillor Wong Tam is asking for a recorded vote. Councillor Matlow, please. Councillor Carroll, please. The motion carries unanimously, 23 in favor. Thank you. Councillor Cressy. Uh, thank you, Speaker. On page five, I can actually release EC 8.9, sustaining the vibrancy of Campbell House Museum. Okay. Oh, with a recorded vote, please. On page 5, EC 8.9, Councillor Cressy is releasing recorded vote. Councillor Kergianis, please. Councillor Pasternak and Councillor Fillion, please. And Councillor Fletcher, when you're seated. The item is adopted unanimously, 24 in favor. Councillor Kerjianis. Madam Speaker, on page 5, I'd like to release EC 8.2, Non-Competitive Agreement for Priority Dispatch Corporation for Priority Training and Quality Assurance Support for Toronto Paramedic Services Use of Medical Priority Dispatch System. With a recorded vote, please. Okay. On page 5, EC 8.2, recorded vote. Councillor Matlow, please. Councillor Ainsley. Councillor Perks, please. The item is adopted unanimously, 24 in favour. Thank you. Councillor Cole. Uh, yes, Madam Chair, I'd like to hold um, EC8. Point one zero Uptown Young Business Improvement Area Board of Management Changes Ward 8, 12, and 15. So you want to hold 8.10, 8, 12, and 8.13? No. Councilor no. Cole, I, I didn't hear what you, what you said. I want to hold EC 8.10, the Uptown Young Business Improvement okay. Area. Okay. Thank you. Councilor Ainsley. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I would like to hold EC 8.13, Assessing Fire Safety and Fire Code Compliance. Thank you. Page 6. Councillor Ford. Um, good morning, Madam Speaker. And, uh, 
colleagues, on page six, I, I have two items I can release. Um, GL 8.8, .8, update on fire and life safety at the City of Toronto and non competitive agreement with Building Reports Canada for provision of fire life safety tracking and compliance software. I'd like to hold that. Okay. Councillor Ainsley, we'd like to hold it. Okay. And the uh, second item in M speaker is GL 8.16. Uh, the City of Toronto 2019-2023 Green Fleet Plan. I'm prepared to finish that. I'd like to hold that line. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Two other people. I'm sorry. <laughs> Page seven. <coughs> Councillor Bylaw. Uh, Madam Speaker, I can release uh, PH 9.1, okay. page 7, okay. uh, proposed revisions to the provincial policy statement. Okay, on page 7, PH 9.1, on favour, recorded vote. Councillor Wong Tam, Mayor Tory, please, thank you. And Councillor Fillion, thank you. The item is adopted unanimously, 24 in favour. Page 8. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, page 7, PH 9.4, focusing on building design improvements. I can release that as well. Okay, on page 7, PH 9.4, on favor, recorded. Councillor Pasternak, please. The item is adopted unanimously, 24 in favor. Councillor Cole. Yes, Madam Chair, I'd like to hold uh, NY9.13. Well, hold on, we're on page seven. Oh, okay. okay, I'm ahead of you. Page eight. Okay, Councillor Cole, you're on page eight. Yes, I'd like to hold NY 9.13 Demolition Application 2296, Eglinton Avenue West. Okay, thank you. Page 9. Councillor Matlow. Madam Speaker, I'd like to hold uh, T 9.4. Uh, 210, 216, uh, 20, 2010, 2016 Bathurst Street. Sorry, where was that? Shot? It's right at the top of the uh, page nine. Page nine. Yeah. Thank you. Councillor Layton? Yes, Madam Speaker, I'd like to hold TE 9.37 is here without recommendations. Construction staging area time extension for Avenue Road. Okay. Page 10. Councillor Cressy. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I'd like to hold item uh, TE 9.84, expediting, expediting and prioritizing safety improvements to Lakeshore Boulevard and Bathurst Street. Thank you. Councillor Fletcher. Fine, I was going to hold 12, two, but I'm fine. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Page 11. Uh, Councillor Thompson. Uh, this is for uh, Tom Dodd and. Uh, oh, okay. Just, just one sec, please. Thank you. We'll go through that. Okay, Councillor Crawford. You have. Um, I understand you have a procedure motion to place at this time. Yeah, I'd like to move that in accordance with Section 27.710 of Council Procedures. City Council remove item EX 9.8, headed Planning Act, Section 37, and Section 45, Reserve Fund Statements. 
2016-18 from the Executive Committee and bring the item forward to City Council for consideration. Okay. All in favor? Carried. Thanks. Councillor Holliday, you have, I understand you have a procedure motion to place at this time as well? Uh, I do, <coughs> Madam Speaker. I'm advised by the clerks I need to read it, so I'll ask members to bear with me for a moment. Um, and it is to uh, bring the audit committee agenda forward to this meeting. Uh, that in accordance with section 27-7.10 of council procedure, city council remove items, AU 4.1 headed cyber safety, a robust cybersecurity program needed to mitigate current and emerging threats, AU 4.2 headed investigation into allegations of reprisal, reprisal not found but lessons learned, AU 4.3 headed Auditor General's 2019 status report on outstanding audit recommendations for city divisions in corporate services and finance and treasury services. AU 4.4 headed review of Toronto Transit Commission's revenue operations phase two, Presto TTC fare equipment and Presto revenue. AU 4.5 headed safeguarding rent gear to income assistance, ensuring only eligible people benefit. AU 4.6 headed fleet services operational review phase two, stronger asset management needed. AU 4.9 headed Auditor General's Office 2020 Work Plan, AU 4.10, headed Auditor General's 2019 Consolidated Status Report and Outstanding Audit Recommendations, AU 14.11, excuse me, AU 4.11, headed Auditor General's Office Forensics Unit Status Report and Outstanding Recommendations, AU 4.17, headed Auditor General's Office Report on the Results of Applying Specified Auditing Procedures to financial information other than financial statements for the year ended December 31st, 2018. AU 4.18 headed transparency in the city's financial information. AU 4.21 headed ARENA's 2018 audited financial statements update and AU 4.22 headed community centers 2018 audited financial statements update from the audit committee and bring these items forward to city council for consideration. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Cressy, you have a I have question? a question of the mover. Just for clarity, for my benefit and all the council, you're seizing these items because the audit committee took place prior to the agenda deadline, and that's the only way to put them in front is to, of council is to seize the items. Sorry. Yes, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Councillor, for the uh, the question. That's correct. Uh, it would it would be because of the proximity of the audit committee meeting to this meeting, it didn't make this meeting's agenda. Uh, it would otherwise be dealt with in a month from now, and uh, I think I sent a note around to members just to give them the heads up to have a look at the audit materials. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, now members of council, their um, the confidential uh, reports. Okay, all in favor? Carry. I believe my speaker's on. Uh, speaker. um, so the confidential report for the audit committee uh, was circulated. Yes, Councillor Layton. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. That in accordance with Section 27-7210 of Council Procedures, City Council Remove Item, IE 8.6, headed Winter Maintenance Program Review from the Infrastructure and Environment Committee and bring the item forward to City Council for consideration. I don't do this, pardon me? I don't do this lightly, uh, colleagues. But I think that, uh, that our Infrastructure and Environment Committee made an error in not allowing this item to proceed to City Council. This will be our last chance to look at improving snow clearing for our roads for this season. Our last chance. We hired a consultant at great expense, as Councillor Min and Wong pointed out, because we don't ha didn't have the expertise in-house to do the review that the Mayor asked for last February. I asked for a similar review, albeit his was more robust, so I stood mine down and his went forward. That review came back with a consultant's report that said, do a pilot. They scanned the jurisdictions around uh, North America and said, do a pilot, 250 kilometers. Here are your technologies available, here's your capacity, and that, that went to city staff. What came to infrastructure and environment was a much, much smaller pilot one that won't necessarily give us the information we need and certainly won't give the level of support to the people of Toronto that need it, as we saw last year. Now, it might not be a big deal for many of you, because most of you represent areas that have sidewalk clearance. Most of you do. 
why I don't really expect this to pass. But I'm putting it forward because for the areas of the city with the highest proportion of pedestrians, meaning the sidewalks that go in the most use, they go almost unusable for some of the winter after major snowfalls. And that's not because because most people don't clear their, their walkways, it's because a handful don't. And if the safety issue wasn't enough for trip and falls, there's an enormous accessibility issue at play here. So, so last summer, my daughter was still in a, in a stroller. I'm pretty able-bodied, I can climb through a snowbank, sure. But on several occasions after that same major snowfall, I'd be walking my daughter to go to the grocery store. We don't own a car, that's not an option for me. The road clearing helps me on my bike, but not when I'm pushing the stroller. On several occasions, I had to physically lift up the stroller with my daughter in it and full of groceries and walk it 10, 15, 30 feet through a snowbank. Again, I can do that. I'm fortunate enough that I can do that. There are many in our city that cannot. There are many that live in these neighborhoods that cannot. The mayor was right in putting forward the request for staff to review this pilot. I'm just afraid that we're not being ambitious enough in actually rolling out the pilot that consultants said. And if I could put the overhead on for a second, I know I didn't tell AB, but there's a, a slide on the overhead I think we should recognize. This is from the consultants report. 96 percent of Torontonians agree with me. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Pasternak. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. This, uh, this item was uh, debated thoughtfully and thoroughly uh, at committee. Uh, we uh, decided to uh, have Councillor Layton uh, take this with him to his colleagues at Budget Committee. I offered to write a, a letter of introduction to the budget chief so he can get it on the agenda at that committee. This is a funding issue. To have a divisive debate here that will go on for hours, which will pit the inner, the inner suburbs versus the downtown is unhealthy. Those debates are from council's past. This is something we don't want here. If you start bringing this to the council, it's nothing but a Trojan horse motion in which we're gonna start talking about New Blanche high-level transit, rideshare, cycling infrastructure, and the disparities of those public policy issues across the city. I strongly urge you not to bring it on the council floor. I urge Councillor Layton to take it to budget committee and see what funding shortfalls are there and then bring it back as part of the 2020 budget debate. Thank you. Can Deputy Mayor Minnewong. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I, I will also echo uh, Councillor Pasternak's uh, concerns. This was um, discussed extensively in committee. Um, if there was such an interest by this whole council, I think I would have seen a lot more members of council show up at show up at the standing committee. Um, uh, secondly, uh, just um, so I just want to correct the record for Councillor Layton. Yes, it, this report did cost a lot of money. Um, and my point was that it should have been done by staff because we have many staff uh, uh, doing policy and all sorts of things. And I think that the, the report, instead of spending, I think, something like $200,000, seems to be my recollection, uh, we could have saved that money. And the, my third point that I raised at the committee was um, for winter maintenance report, the money was taken out of capital, which, you know, that is another. Councillor Pasternak raised this issue uh, before. And uh, this is the second time that that's happened. But I, w but I will say this, it was done, at, it was discussed at committee. And oh, the third point, and this is actually really important, Councillor Layton may not understand the arrangements in other places outside the, t the downtown, in the suburbs. We have trouble pushing around uh, um, baby carriages all over the city, even when they're plowed. So this is not, you know, to say that there's some sort of special problem in the downtown with regard to pushing things and, and, and if people with mobility problems is completely false. Those problems still exist in the suburbs. So it is, is, it is, it is a fundamental lack of the understanding of the rest of the city when, when that statement is made.
But we had that discussion in committee. Um, I think Councillor Pasternak is right. Um, this is a budget matter uh, in many ways, and it should be dealt with there. Thank you. Councillor Perks. Thank you, Speaker. I, I want to pick up a thought that uh, the Deputy Mayor just had, which is that Torontonians have problems navigating our streets in the winter. If you have a, a walker, a scooter, a stroller, you walk with a cane, uh, if you're carrying a heavy load. And he says, well, you know, we don't want to look at this pilot because, uh, you know, there are other places in the city where there are problems too. Well, if that's the case, we should be taking strong action right across the city to make sure that Torontonians are not slipping and falling during the winter or worse, being made to walk on the road because the sidewalks are impassable. There are several, several streets in my ward where there are long stretches of privately held property, sometimes held by institutions, maybe even the school board, and those don't get cleaned in a timely fashion. Sometimes these are on hills. So you have people who literally cannot get out of their homes and up the street to the bus stop. They are housebound because they have some mobility challenge or they have small children they have to take with them. We claim to take seriously the fact that our streets are not safe for pedestrians right now. Councillor Layton and the Mayor have done work to try to deal with the particular hazard that happens in the winter, and instead of this Council having that information in front of it so that we as a Council can give directions to City staff to prepare something so that we can debate it with information in front of us during the budget, some members of this council just want it swept away. It is disingenuous in the worst way to say, oh, just deal with it at budget, when there has been no policy debate at this council based on the study that the Works Committee had in front of it. We decide policy give directions to staff to cost the implementation of the policy, and then debate it at budget time. The actions taken at the Infrastructure Environment Committee mean that we will not be in a position to do that. It's very deliberate. It's a very deliberate effort to keep public safety off the agenda, away from the budget, away from our ability to actually invest in making people able who have disabilities able to walk on our streets or travel our streets during the winter. It's scurrilous. Thank you. Councillor Fletcher. I say I'm going to look that up now, scurrilous. Um. <laughs> that may trend on Google for a second as we're all trying to Hashtag scurrilous. <laughs> I just want to say for a minute about mobility. Um, I'm really surprised to hear the deputy mayor say that people can't move around on sidewalks anywhere else uh, even when they're cleared. That's just a shock. Uh, I wonder why we're clearing them if that's the case in North York and in other places. So if that is the case, I think we need to hear that in a debate because we're spending a lot of money and if people in North York can't get on their sidewalks to get down the street to get to the bus, then that should be considered a very large problem here by this City Council because we're, we've never been told that before and we've not been told that officially. I just want to say I'm going to talk about uh, seniors and there is a program still in the old city of Toronto which is the only place that has no snow clearing. East York has snow clearing and that is where a senior can get their sidewalk cleared in front of their home because they don't have the mobility to do that. However, once your sidewalk's cleared in front of your home, you can't move up and down the street because it doesn't mean everybody else's sidewalk is cleared. And we do have something where you go out and people have 48 hours and then they might get a ticket or they might get a fine or the city might come and do it. But really and truly, as far as getting mobility in the wintertime and having everybody move around, then this is a real problem. You can't just have right in front of your 25 feet cleared and nowhere else. That's the first thing. 
Second, interestingly enough, and we haven't had a chance, won't have a chance to debate this unless Councillor Layton's uh, motion passes, that previously um, I'd been in touch with transportation about. Count Councillor Fletcher, yes? I'm sorry, I have to interject. Why? Uh, we are debating now if we should bring that motion yes, forward and I bring am. the item forward, not into the substance. Well, I'm bringing it forward because there's de there is unfairness completely in not having this here. Okay. And there's unfairness for citizens, many, probably 800,000 of them, that they are not having this council debate this issue. So the former East York had snow clearing. It was moved down to the boundary in order to cover both wards 29 and 31, former councils, councillors Fragadakis and, and uh, Davis. I'd said, could you please move this down in streets that are the same and was told it's just ward specific. Well, folks, we all have bigger wards and time to make it ward specific all the way where it was supposed to go. I also think it's very hard, Madam Speaker, to have the chair of the committee be so disparaging about the city of Toronto, the old city, and say, well, you, if we don't have bike lanes, if we don't have Nuit Blanche, if we don't have everything else, you're not having snow clearing. And I find that very serious. I'm extremely, extremely disappointed okay, in the committee chair. Councillor Fletcher, let's, let's uh, talk on the motion. Yeah. Councillor Matlow. This, um, this happens year after year after year. And um, this, this is, I mean, this really is a reflection of representative democracy here. What you're hearing from councillors in the old city of Toronto, uh, including myself now, is that legacy uh, city of Toronto, is that, is that um, this is a, a genuine and real concern by residents in our communities. This, is, this impacts our lives every single day and every single night uh, during the winter season. We live in a Canadian city, and as Councillor Layden pointed out, this is our last opportunity to address this coming season. It's getting cold out now. It's gonna get cold in the next week. It's gonna get colder in the next month. That's what happens here. And there's gonna be coming days when accessibility and safety, it's not just rhetoric that we're using. It, it, it legitimately is a concern. Uh, there are seniors who have mobility challenges and have trouble getting down the sidewalks. Imagine yourself if you were in a wheelchair. Just imagine yourself right now. If you were listening, hypothetically. <laughs> the mayor, when, when residents were outraged about the low standard of snow clearing last winter, stood up and said, okay, we're gonna address this, we're gonna deal with this. So many people here said that they cared about it. And if you look at this, I mean, does it look like they care at all, whatsoever? I'm not convinced at all. If we really care about the safety and the accessibility of our residents, we would budget for it this year, and we would ensure that we do what many other Canadian cities do, which is recognize that we are a Canadian city that has a lot of snow. And that gets in the way of people's ability to get around, to get to school, to get to work, to get to places of faith, to see their families and friends, and it also is a direct threat to their safety every single day. And that's what Councillor Layden is arguing. That's what I'm arguing. That's what my colleagues are arguing. And by the way, with respect to Councillor Pasternak's comments, I think that was really unfair to Councillor Layden. And the reason I say that is because what we're asking for is not to go to the law, lowest common denominator for, for residents across the city. It's about bringing up the standards for every resident. If you live in Scarborough and you walk downtown, or if you live in downtown and you want to walk in North York, or anywhere in between, that every resident should have the opportunity to walk safely and have an accessible city that's caring, that's caring for them. That's what we should be doing. So what is this really about? Why is this being shoved off? Because this council isn't serious about this. I'm not convinced it is. I'm not convinced this mayor is either, or else he'd whip you guys to vote for it. That's the reality here. And what, what I see is that we just don't want to spend the money on this. This is not a priority. And I think we need a reality check because all of you, you work here, you're going to be walking downtown. Try bringing your kids down here. Try walking with a friend who's in a wheelchair or in crutches or moving with a cane. Try that. We have an opportunity to be leaders here and far too often we fail. This is a moment that we can step up. It's your choice. Thank you.
Councillor Bylaw. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I, I, I do as well take issue with uh, um, the statement that bringing this matter to the floor of council would be divisive. I actually believe that being divisive is actually not addressing heads-on an inequity that exists in our city. And when you ignore something that councillors downtown year after year bring to this chamber uh, on behalf of our constituents that needs to be addressed, um, ignoring that, I think that is being divisive. So I would like to have this matter discussed in here because to have a big part of the city where the majority of people walk. You have a high percentage of our residents that walk around, walk to TTC, walk to their, in, in their daily lives, probably most, and, and I would say uh, a lot more than in, even in other parts of the city, uh, um, that not having their, their sidewalks cleaned, I think that's, that's not the best service that we, should, that we should and could be providing. The other thing as well is I haven't seen anything in this report to actually look at how we manage contracts to deal with uh, uh, winters that are quite different. And you know what, with climate change, we have uh, different scenarios more and more often. And that, that's what I thought happened last winter, is that we didn't have the capability of managing our contractors, and our contracts did not allow for the flexibility that we needed to clean our streets, because I believe all of us, all across the, street, the, the city, had issues with snow clearing last year. And I didn't see anything in this report, and I'm wondering how we're gonna explain to our constituents when so, if something happens this winter, and again, we don't have the capabilities of properly dealing with the contracts that we have. That is why I would like to have that, that issue brought to us in here. It is to address the inequity that we have uh, on, on sidewalk cleaning, but as well to understand how we're gonna respond to these scenarios that we have that are more common now than ever, and that I felt this season, and I heard from my constituents, they felt the same way, that we were not able to respond. And that's why I think we should be discussing this here and should be brought to the floor of council and be support, supporting Councillor Layton. Thank you. Councillor Wong Tam. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. The issue before us is not necessarily just one of budget. Uh, we need to be able to put an accessibility human rights lens over this particular matter. The City of Toronto has obligations to meet the Ontario for um, the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act. And that means that our obligations uh, extend to that of making sure that the services that the City of Toronto provide, including access to public services, access to public spaces, must be free of all barriers. Whether it's temporary barriers because of a heavy snowfall or perhaps a construction sign that's been left behind or perhaps um, uh, sandwich boards that are, are on the street, all those barriers have got to be removed for accessibility. There is very little point, Madam Speaker, to having even a program that people living with disabilities and seniors who would, who would be able to qualify to fill out a form to have the frontage of their property cleared if they can't go beyond the frontage of their property. We need to be able to connect the dots. And by connecting the dots, Madam Speaker, it means that we need to be able to put an accessibility human rights lens over this. This is not just a, an issue around uh, the budget, and this is not just an issue around the, the, the inner suburbs or the downtown core, because the fact remains, Madam Speaker, is the majority of the people walking downtown Monday to Friday during the peak business hours in the financial district and beyond, they are coming from well outside of the old city of Toronto boundaries. They're residing elsewhere, they're coming downtown, and those people from Scarborough, North York, and Etobicoke are actually traversing our city streets with a lot of difficulty. They are having difficulty navigating those, navigating those streets. So Madam Speaker, I really, uh, I do think that this issue, to be quite honest, this particular report should have gone before the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee, which is the committee that was struck up largely to provide advice to City Council on making sure that we can eliminate barriers and, to, and eliminate undue hardship for those who are facing uh, barriers uh, to access to city services, and that should have, that should have been one step before it even got to the uh, Infrastructure and the Environment Committee. And because we missed TAC, the, the TAC committee, that at the very least what we should do is bring this forward and have this discussion today uh, at City Council. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Carroll. Madam Speaker, I just wanted to speak uh, in favour of the motion to bring the item, and I wanted to do so as a councillor who represents north of the 401. I don't think we can argue that I'm a, a, a suburban councillor. 
uh, my entire ward is north of the 401. And uh, while on any given day I have respect for, for my colleague who is chair of the Works Committee, I wish to disassociate myself from the comment that he made that having a conversation about accessibility somehow will pit me against downtown councillors. I see that as one of my many citywide responsibilities, and if it's an issue for my colleagues in the downtown core, it is an issue for me as a sworn councillor. Accessibility is a citywide issue. My residents go downtown to go onto a neighborhood street and babysit their grandchildren for a day. Or the generations are reversed and they're going downtown to visit their parents for the day. We live throughout the city. Our, our residents don't stay in their ward as if it was some fortress. They travel throughout the city and accessibility is an issue for them anywhere. And if that is an issue for my colleagues in the legacy city of Toronto, then it must be an issue for council. And so I, I sincerely hope that if this needs to be discussed, that we're going to bring it forward. I think one of the things that I'll want to discuss is when we, when we set out to have a consultant look at a problem, maybe we need to be more mindful at looking at what are the terms of that call out for a consultant. What are we looking for in the results of that consultancy? What are we, what are we hoping to find? Are we in any way prejudicing the results? Or are we really looking for a fair assessment? And are we, uh, are we looking for action-oriented advice? Because if we got some here, and we did, why aren't we willing to debate it and decide whether we can do it now? Because it's true, you can't simply punt this. There's a financial impact if you're sincere at all about doing something about ac accessibility issues. And Councillor Layton's motion moves it here now because, as the report tells us, if we don't decide now to do something about it, you can't do a damn thing until later in 2022 when we're tendering out the next contract. Not a damn thing. You won't change a single thing. And if you look at the graphs, we're about due for a very snowy year. It runs in cycles, and the extreme years come, and we're just about due for another one. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Councillor Ainsley. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm uh, going to be supporting the motion that Councillor Layton's put forward. And I'm going to be supporting it because in my household, we have the same debate each and every year, each winter. My ward's in the southeast corner of Scarborough, and I have a lot of friends in the downtown core. Uh, they come out, and nine times out of ten, they get in the front door of my house, and they'll say, you know, we had a really long trip. And I'm like, so what took you so long? It's like, well, you know, once we got east of Victoria Park, we kept stopping in shock and amazement at the cleanliness of your sidewalks <laughs> in the winter. Oh. Yeah, Councillor Kerr, Janice, come on. And, and when I do the reverse and I go down there, my children are much older now. Uh, I go through their areas trying to push a baby carriage when our children were much younger and saw the difficulties that they go through. Uh, over the years, I've asked staff, you know, why can't we clear the sidewalks? What's the problem? And staff have often said to me, we don't have the right equipment. We don't know where we would put the snow. Um, I've discussed with Councillor Layton a couple of times uh, because I have friends of mine that live in his ward. And we've looked at equipment in Montreal where they, similar style of sidewalks, they use it to melt the ice, clear the snow, and they ask why they can't do it in Toronto. My friends, when we talked about a pilot project, they were like, great, we're outside the pilot project area. You all know that we have a concern and an issue around sidewalk snow clearing. Why can't you just do it? And I think sending something to budget committee, I, everybody knows how it works here. If you send something to budget committee without some type of debate or policy, the budget committee sends it back to the committee or they defer it because there hasn't been a policy put in place or debated. And I think that as we look at accessibility, um, encouraging people to walk, to take public transit, uh, cycle, use our sidewalks, not driving, I think this is one, one of these debates that we need to have. So I'll be supporting the motion. Thank you. Councillor Peruzza. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. Speaker, I also believe that this is a conversation that we need to have. Uh, I believe that the mayor had a great deal of courage 
in, in basically requesting or moving the motion that generated the report in the first place. And the, and the part of the reason why that was done was because we're not doing a very, very good job of clearing our snow in the wintertime. Now, whether you believe you need sidewalk clearing in the downtown or uptown or whatever, the reality is that currently the way we're, um, you know, we remove snow off our streets isn't working. It's not working well. Nobody is saying hip, hip, hooray. That report, you know, had a study in it that basically said, oh, my God, we did a survey, hip, hip, hooray, we're doing a spanky job of clearing the snow. Well, I don't know who they were talking to, right? Because whoever they were talking to, uh, you know, it, 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 that's not the case. In fact, in fact, each and every one of you know that as the snow season approaches, you're all in a kind of like in a, you know, crouched position knowing that there's a whole bunch of phone calls that are going to come that are going to say you're not doing a really, really good job. You're going to say, my crescent is blocked in because they had no other place to store the snow. They stored it on my street. My windows haven't been cleaned. The sidewalk, you can't walk and they cleared it, but you can't walk on it. So we need to have a conversation about how we do this. We spend a great deal of money, some $90 million plus 20 when you look at it and you, you translate that to snow events, the 40 to 60, take the average, 24 hours, we're spending somewhere in the neighborhood of $87,000 an hour to clear snow off our streets. If nothing else, just that number alone should give you pause for concern and, and pause for reflection. 87 some thousand dollars. I understand that it's simple math. I get that. And somebody's going to stand up and say that but it should give you pause for reflection in terms of how we're clearing the snow off our streets. Maybe we need a hybrid system, I don't know. But we need to look at it. Because we're not getting value for our money. The job isn't being well done and it's a conversation that we absolutely need to continue to have. Thank you. Okay, just to remind members, we are discussing to bring this item forward. We're not debating the item. Councillor Holliday. Thanks, Madam Speaker. Uh, it's a bit of a frustrating conversation I'm watching unfold before me. Yeah. Uh, because I believe that we live in a city that isn't equal all over it. And there's a bit of joy in that. There's different configurations, different streetscapes. And they all have different qualities. I'm sort of chuckling listening to my colleagues. With the, how tough it is to get along the sidewalk. You know, when I leave my house in the winter after a heavy snowfall, you don't go too early. You know why? Because you have to wait for the first car to go down the street so I can follow the wheel ruts to the bus stop. Yeah, you know what? I don't even have a sidewalk in front of my house. And there's a lot of people in central Etobicoke that don't have one either. Yeah, and we're okay with that because that's what we're used to. That's what we have in our neighborhoods. You know, stand here and talk about that you don't have their sidewalk cleared fast enough. You know, I think we actually have pretty darn good service levels in the city when it comes to winter maintenance. And I accept Councillor Peruzza. I know that after a snowfall, all of us councillors go through a lot of calls where a very complicated operation doesn't unfold perfectly every time. But for the most part, and I think if you asked most people, I think they tell you the service levels are pretty good. $90 million a year spent on snow clearing. And this is a material conversation. You want to add an entire section of the city where you can't run a plow like you can out in the burbs where it, it goes down the sidewalk, you know, in the, in the darkness of the night at 4 a.m. in the morning, if you're lucky, the plow goes by in the middle of the night. Um, we're talking about much narrower sections, things that might have to be hand dug because there's posts and, and obstructions and concrete retaining walls. And if you, councillors, you think you got a lot of calls now about difficulty in snow clearing? Wait till you try to go and navigate a little tiny maze and you get calls from residents saying they missed, you know, a six inch strip or they, uh, they took out my front retaining wall because the sidewalk is so confined. I've seen uh, snow plows that have ripped entire timbers from here to the speaker right out of the ground in the middle of the night because it's dark. In any case, I, uh, I don't think we should be opening up this conversation right now. 
I think if you sit and think about it, uh, there's a lot of things that are unequal in different parts of the city. And, you know, that, that is really the, the features and the attributes of what we have. This just comes down to a conversation of money in one area wanting to see more money spent in that area. I don't need to go there. I don't think we've got the, the budget to do that. I think we should leave it alone. The committee did its work. Uh, those that spoke at the committee, congratulations. If you didn't go to the committee and debate this, well, I don't know why we want to bring it here. Thank you. Councillor Cressy. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Um, we talk a lot in this chamber about the safety of our streets. We have a lot of conversations about Vision Zero. Here is an example where each of us will have a vote. And if you press green, that is a vote that will look at the safety of our streets for this year. If you press red, you will be voting against looking at the safety of our streets for this year. That's it. You vote green, you're saying you are prepared to look at Vision Zero consequences in part of this city during the winter months. You vote red, you're saying maybe we'll look at those, that safety next year. Thank you very much. Councillor Kerjanis. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Cleaning snow is very important. It doesn't matter if you're downtown, it doesn't matter if you're in the suburbs, it doesn't matter where you live in the city of Toronto. And every citizen should have the same accessibility. I realize that in the former city of Toronto downtown, it's more difficult to clean the snow and the sidewalks are more narrow, the cars are parked more tighter. And we need to look at equipment that is uh, probably hybrid equipment that is, is able to get in there. However, in the same token, Madam Speaker, a couple of years back, it was in April, and we got a, a sudden April uh, s snowstorm. And I um, was outside my constituency office on Finch Avenue, and the streets across the street were not clean. The sidewalk was not clean. When downtown was certainly being cleaned up, even the bicycle lanes downtown were cleaned up. So if we want to talk about equality, we've got to make sure that we look at a wholesale concept of not just downtown or in Scarborough or in Etobicoke, not where you just got um, sidewalks or you don't have sidewalks. Some of your streets, Council Holiday, do not want sidewalks because they got an extended uh, driveway and they park more cars. So if we're going to look at this, I'm not sure if this is the appropriate place to look at it or at the committee. I would say to you that we got to look at it wholesale. We cannot leave one street behind. We cannot leave one constituent behind. We cannot close our eyes to one individual. So if we're going to look at it, I think we got to look at it wholesale. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Councillor Lai? I'll just be very quick. Uh, I, as a new term councillor here, I, don't, I wasn't aware that uh, Toronto doesn't have any really sidewalk cleaning. And I've always said that Scarborough is Toronto. And now I think Toronto is Toronto. So I think uh, it's a very good debate here. And I think I've heard so much. And I think uh, everybody <laughs> is, should have been you know, have the same equitable, same accessibility, and with the same snow clearing service that uh, the whole Toronto uh, should be entitled for. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Thompson. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Speaker. I rise, Speaker, as I struggle with this particular issue because we certainly want to ensure that we provide uh, safe streets, safe sidewalks for all of our residents at all period of time, snow, summer, and so on. Um, clearly, we've heard some of the comments that's been made this morning, and the perception is that there is a laissez-faire, non-caring attitude by some members of council if we don't bring this particular matter forward for discussion here. What I'm concerned about, Speaker, I recall having this conversation with Gary Welsh some time ago. He was responsible for snow clearing in the city. When we launched the Scarborough program many years ago, I wasn't a member of council then, it was through the billboards, the bus shelter advertising where the revenues came from to fund the sidewalk snow clearing, which was launched in Scarborough many years ago. I think Joyce Trimmer was the mayor at that particular point in time. The objective was we wanted to ensure that we can clear the sidewalks to allow people to have great accessibility and so on. What we discovered later on in terms of looking at downtown Toronto, and I think this was around 1998, 1999, there were great disparities with respect to how the sidewalks, the roadways were constructed, vehicles and so on in the downtown core. And it made it rather difficult with respect to the types of equipment 
that were being utilized elsewhere because of the, um, you know, the, the width and the dimensions of the sidewalks and the roadway speaker. What I've heard and have some discussions with staff this morning is that there's a pilot program that's on the way to address this very issue. And in as much as people want to create an emotional uh, state in this council, which would say there are some of you who don't care about the safety and responsibility, which is our job to make sure everyone is safe. The challenge that we have, in as much as we spend $90 million a year plus to clear snow in this city, and we know it's not perfect, the fact of the matter is that we can have this discussion here today for the next two days and still not solve the problem unless we put a real process in place, unless we identify the equipment that we need to make it happen. Because I understand many of the pieces of equipment that are needed in the downtown core isn't really available. And if it is, it's not sufficient to do what we want, so we'll still have this disparity. So I don't want anyone to, to you know, take the position that we don't care. We do. We need to ensure that we do things properly. Councillor Holliday talked a little bit about when you're clearing it, you're going to make just great damages. The number of calls that we get beyond simply just the issue around snow clearing, it's around property damage, whether or not it's sod, whether or not it's, uh, you know, a post that's put in place and so on and so forth. Speaker, let's do it properly. And let's, as someone always say, let's base it on the evidence that's needed in order to do it correctly. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, last speaker, Mayor Tory. Well, Madam Speaker, um, I, I really just concur in the comments just made by uh, Councillor Deputy Mayor Thompson. But I, I want to just bring us back to reality here in terms of what this report said. What this report said. First of all, we asked for a report that, among other things, looked at a review of best practices and technology and looked at the question of uh, clearing sidewalks in Toronto and East York uh, Community Council area. And, and, and I wanted to say that, that the, the, the report and the conclusion of the committee was that based on the recommendation from the very same consultant who's referred to, the very same one that people were saying, we spent all this money, we're paying no attention, what did that consultant recommend? That consultant, consultant recommended, and the staff concurred and recommended to the committee which concurred, that we should do a pilot project, exactly as Deputy Mayor Thompson just said. And I'll just read the words, because I think it's worthy of reading the other words that are here too, and some of the other public opinion conclusions. And I'm not happy that 50, only 57% of people across the city um, said they were generally satisfied with the way in which we deal with winter maintenance services provided by the City of Toronto, but there was some uh, survey flashed up there for two seconds that made it look like it was 95-5, and that's just not so. Let me just read from the report. Based on this work, it was found that the City of Toronto meets or exceeds the winter maintenance levels of service for roadways, bike lanes, and sidewalk compared to other GTA peer cities, Brampton, Hamilton, Mississauga, London, and York Region. And then it says all the areas of comparison, and it included sidewalk clearing practices. And then it goes on to say, furthermore, from the Ipsos survey, it found that a majority, 57% of residents, are satisfied with the winter maintenance services provided by the City of Toronto. I want that number to go up. We all do. But at the end of the day, this notion that somehow it was 95 to 5, and that that's what people think about this overall, is, I think, uh, not putting all the facts in front of the people that are watching this debate today or in front of this council. Then I want to read the operative paragraph, because the impression was left that there was going to be no pilot project if we didn't bring this here for some hours-long debate, which I believe presents false choices. Those who would say you're either in favor of safety or against it, what a ridiculous articulation of what we're dealing with here that is. What it is saying here, and I'll quote from the report, based on the recommendations contained with the HDR report, that's the consultant, Staff will undertake an equipment test using in-house equipment to mechanically clear snow from sidewalks in areas of the city not currently serviced. The testing will prioritize locations that are currently part of the senior sidewalk clearing program, where seniors and persons with disabilities can apply to have their sidewalks cleared manually by the city at no cost. During the, st uh, the test, staff will also undertake the development of an inventory of sidewalk conditions and encroachments. Furthermore, staff will imp implement an improved communications campaign to better inform the public about the services the city provides and service levels they can expect during the winter weather. 
it talks about doing exactly a pilot project, trying to make sure, as Deputy Mayor Thompson said, that if we're going to look at doing this, if we're going to look at it, it's based on evidence as to whether the equipment we have works properly. Do you need other equipment if you're going to do it? Uh, it is, something, is it something that you can do in whole, in part, or not at all, based on the particular configuration of the sidewalks we're talking about here? It's exactly the way we should make decisions instead of bringing things here and having a big debate here where you just sort of say, well, cost is no object. The fact we may not even have the equipment to do it is no object. Forget about that. And, and, and this is the same people who are constantly saying we should be making decisions based on evidence, based on the actual practical realities of whether we have equipment or not to get this job done. And that is exactly what this report says we should do. Do a test. Do it in areas that focus on those who are in particular need, seniors and, and, uh, and uh, people with differing abilities. See how we make out with our current equipment. Um, see what was, would be required and what we learned from that in order to, if we decided to go forward and do this across the city, what would be required. That's the right way to make <coughs> decisions as opposed to bringing it here and politicizing it into something where people know better than to say, even if we wanted to, that we could do this job this winter short of going out and hiring hundreds of people with shovels uh, to go out and, and shovel all the walks. It's just not something that we've actually looked at in the context of practicality and feasibility. And I think to mislead people into thinking that that is something we could do is not a service to the public. This is the right way to do it. This is what the consultants recommended. This is what the staff recommended. This is what the committee decided. And we should stick. That's why we have a committee system, so they can hear from the consultants and hear from the staff and make sure that they do uh, the right thing in the context of making decisions properly based on evidence. So I support uh, the, the fact that we stick with where we were going with this, which will have a project, a pilot project, undertaken this winter, and we will learn from that and take it from there. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Ca uh, Councillor Lane, he had a question this to the Mayor? This is just a question to, to, to clarify. The question to the Mayor, on, to clarify, because the statement he had made said this is what the consultants recommended. But in fact, would you at least acknowledge that the size of the pilot is not what the consultants recommended? I will acknowledge that the staff uh, recommended a pilot project of the size that is recommended here, and that there was some discussion of a, a larger pilot by the consultants, yes. But at the end of the day, there's going to be a pilot project undertaken. It is going to focus on areas of the people in particular need uh, that I think we all agree on, which are seniors and uh, people with differing abilities, and that is what is recommended here. There will be a pilot. We will see if the equipment is adequate. We'll see if it works. We'll see what the practical implications are of doing something broader, which we can then discuss at committee and here at a later time. So just the, the consultants recommended 250 kilometers as a pilot. Can you tell me how large the city pilot will be under what staff recommended? I, I just asked that question, to, to be honest, and I, I don't have that number, so I can't stand here. I could, I'm sure I could try and get I, it. I don't think we have that number, which okay. was one of the major problems at committee, that we have a consultant recommending a 250 kilo, kilometer pilot, and we don't know how large the pilot is. I agree with staff in that focusing on this particular area would make sense, but it, Th that was not clear in the report, the area that it would be. I'm told the number is 150 kilometers. So I would view that as a significant uh, pilot project. It is admittedly uh, less than what the consultant might have talked about, but 150, if it was 15 versus 200, I would say that there's a reason to believe it's not something that's going to be adequate to give to us an to idea. But I'm told the number is 150. I just wanted us to make that clear, that it's not the pilot that was recommended from the consultant. And it's also it not something pilot. that's tiny. It's 150, Madam Speaker, 150 kilometers, which I would say is a very significant pilot project no, that will affect it, it's thousands of people. 150 of 7,900, so let's just keep it in, in scale, okay? Thank you. Um, Councilor Wong Tam, question to the Mayor? Uh, yes, thank you very much, and thank you, Mayor, for your comments. That was very helpful. I wanted to just ask, uh, because the, the item, uh, we, we receive many items before the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee. Oftentimes, they are policies and uh, uh, and program directions that uh, eliminate barriers for people with living with disabilities. Uh, were you surprised to know that uh, our committee never received this particular report uh, for, for some comment or deliberation before it, it went to uh, the Infrastructure and uh, Environment Committee? I, I am actually, I wasn't aware of that. Uh, and 
Obviously, uh, as part of the exercise we're going to go through now with the pilot project and, and with the focus of the pilot project on uh, the uh, areas of the city that, uh, and, the, and the people who presently receive some snow clearing from us uh, pursuant to programs that are meant to help seniors and per persons with uh, differing abilities, that I think it would be a perfectly appropriate time, perhaps before and after the pilot, to consult that group. Uh, and to, uh, but it doesn't change the fact. You know, if we'd gone there and they'd sort of said, well, we believe that uh, it should be the case that we should have sidewalk clearing across the city because people with differing abilities live across the city, I would say I acknowledge that. People, seniors and people with differing abilities live across the city. But it doesn't change the fact that those who are trying to create the impression here that we have the equipment in place now and the, the ability to go and do this job across the city in every one of those places are creating a false impression and trying to get us to make a decision without the evidence in hand to help the very people you're talking about. Yeah, and thank you. I'm, I'm not going to um, uh, forecast what the committee members would have said or not said. Um, I do know that we have a committee meeting coming up shortly. It's at the beginning of November. Uh, would you support this report, uh, even though it's, it wasn't necessarily going to our committee, would you support this report now uh, going before the TAC members to at least have a review and a staff uh, presentation? Once the parameters of the pilot project are set out uh, clearly um, and so on, I'm quite happy to seek input at that time uh, from that group, but I think what's more important is going to be to seek their input after the pilot project is done so that we'll be able to say to them, this is what the pilot project told us. Um, can we get your comments on how the pilot project did or did not work for you? Um, you know, did you think things were better? Were they the same? Were they worse? Um, and I would certainly support that kind of an examination, which I think will give us the most useful input. You know, we could go tomorrow, Madam Speaker, to the committee and say to them, what do you think about the idea of putting elevators into all subway stations right away? And they would say, of course, as I would, as you would, through you, Madam Speaker, let's do that. But we also know that there are huge, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, practical challenges involved in putting those elevators into those subway stations all at once tomorrow morning. And that's why we're doing it on a phased basis. And that's why we're doing a pilot project here, to be responsible about how you go about making the decision. So I'm quite happy to see it go there. I think the best time for it to go is after the pilot project, right away, and say, what did you think? Did it work? Did it help? Uh, and so on. Um, and, and thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, for those comments. I think that for the committee members, uh, just, uh, just to remind Council, um, and uh, for myself as well, is that the, the TAC committee uh, provides advice, strategic advice to the executive committee, and then the executive committee will sort of move that along as they, as they deem fit. Uh, so TAC does not, is not in any per particular position to direct uh, staff or even to direct City Council. Uh, Council, I, your question, Yes, yeah, so my, my question is that I, I do think, uh, and I hope that the Mayor would agree, that there is uh, material benefits to having uh, the committee members provide strategic advice before the pilot project is, uh, is rolled out. Uh, would you not agree? Well, I think that getting their advice anytime will be useful to us. And so, as I say, I will certainly talk to our staff about when is best to put it in front of them. But you have my undertaking. It will be put in front of them uh, because I think their advice would be most valuable. I happen to believe the most valuable advice we'll get from them will be after the pilot project is done to see. But I think their advice in helping us to uh, run the pilot project might also be useful. But I'll talk to the city staff about that. And you have my undertaking to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so on the motion, recorded vote. Councillor Carroll, please. Councillor Fletcher. The motion does not carry. The vote is 13 to 12. The required two-thirds majority has not been achieved. Okay. Um, the, the clerk will distribute the removed items. Members, please note that the, several of the audit committee items have confidential attachments. These materials were previously distributed to members with the audit committee agenda. I will now consider a request to make items urgent and time specific. Councillor Thompson. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Speaker. On page five, uh, EC 8.16 being held by Council Cressy, and we're in agreement. Uh, this is the provincial funding changes and previously approved child care capital projects update. 
I'd like to ask that this item be dealt with as the first item for tomorrow. And the rationale for that, Speaker, we're waiting. We, we have to have this thing done by Thursday um, as it relates to an agreement with the province that has to be um, finalized. So I don't want it to be dealt with on Thursday. Which, so, uh, sorry, Councillor Thompson, uh, page five, which item? Um, my, okay, uh, EC 8.1616. Okay. And, Speaker, I'm also ready to move the... Um, the okay, petition well, let, let's when just we, vote on this done. first. Sure. Thanks. Okay, all in favor? Carried. Okay, Councillor Thompson. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. Uh, Speaker, I have a petition signed by about 130 uh, residents in the Mondeo uh, area of uh, my ward. Uh, it's a Birchmount, Ellesmere, Kennedy, Ellesmere area. And they're requesting uh, the installation of speed uh, bump or humps um, uh, in front of 83 Mondale Drive uh, in order to ensure the safety of the children. There is a park on the west side just in front of 83 Mondale and the speeding uh, there is, is rather excessive. There are other measures that are being implemented as well, but the residents are requesting uh, speed bumps or humps at this location. Thank you. Okay, all in favor of receiving the petitions? Recorded vote? Recorded vote. Councillor Monte, thank you. The motion to receive carries unanimously 25 in favor. Okay, thank you. All those in favor of adopting the order paper and all items not held, recorded vote. Pardon? Okay, so we'll vote on first, uh, there was an interest on EC 8.6 and EC 8.8, .8, which Council Wong Tam has a, an interest. So Council Wong Tam, if you can... Okay, so Council Wong Tam. Yeah. On EC 8.6, recorded vote. Councilor Karagiannis, please. The item is adopted unanimously, 24 in favor. EC 8.8, .8, recorded vote. Councillor Cole, please. Councillor Ford, please. The item is adopted unanimously, 24 in favor. Okay, all those in favor of adopting the order paper and all items not held, recorded vote. Councillor Bailao, thank you. Mayor Tory, please, thank you. The motion to adopt the order paper carries unanimously 24 in favor. Thank you. Members of Council, I want to stress the importance of preparing your motions in advance. The clerk staff are here to help you prepare your motions. In particular, if you intend to move a motion during the release of holds, I will insist that your motion be prepared in advance and given to the clerk. If you do not have your motion ready, I will not recognize you. And I'm also reminding members that you must state your motion first before you speak to it. Member City Council follows a routine for the processing and adding of any motions without notice during the meeting. Please remember that a motion without notice must include a reason for urgency. 
If you have an urgent motion without notice you wish to bring forward at this meeting, please give your motion to the city clerk staff. They will prepare the necessary procedure motion for my review along with your motion. The chair must agree the motion is urgent before you can seek leave to introduce it at this meeting. It will require 18 votes to add a motion without notice to the agenda during the meeting. Motions added to the agenda in this way are not subject to a vote to waive referral to a committee or agency. I will be reviewing all motions carefully and will advise council after each recess which motions need a motion to add to the agenda. We will now go to the mayor's first key item, EX, EX 9.1, uh, Toronto, Ontario Transit Update. Questions? Do we have any questions? Okay, on the, on the item on favor, carry. <laughs> Councillor Cressy, questions? Thank you, Speaker. Uh, I'll begin with questions to the city manager. From the negotiations and what's in front of us, um, the identified benefits in front of us, so from your perspective, the upload is off, that's a benefit? Uh, through the Speaker, that's correct. The investment or the commitment of new provincial dollars towards transit ex expansion, that's, an, that's a benefit? Uh, through the speaker, correct. The fact that the province takes on risk associated with those lines and expansion, that's a benefit? That's right. Um, and the possibility to actually get some relief for line one, that is a benefit, is that correct? Through the speaker, that's correct. Okay. Uh, some of the concerns <laughs> associated with it, uh, let me look at some of the different lines. I'll begin with the Scarborough extension. Perhaps I'll go to TTC. Uh, our previous one-stop subway expansion plan was at what percentage design and at what expected opening date? Through the speaker, uh, there was three elements of the design. There was a tunnel design which was 100%. The station's design was at 60% and the system's design was round about 85%. Uh, when you looked at the schedule, the schedule was on risk was 2026 and risk was 2027. Okay, so 85 to 100% design for those three elements in 2026, maybe 2027 opening, correct? Through the chair, that's correct. Okay, for the delivery of new transit in Scarborough under the plan in front of us, what percentage design are we for the three stops? Uh, through the chair, at this point, I can't make that assessment because that's now with Metrolinks. Do, have Metrolinks told us what percentage design they are at? We were at 85 to 100%. Uh, not just, no, they have not confirmed that. Okay, what is the expected opening that Metrolinks has told us for the new plan for Scarborough? As part of the provincial announcement, they talked about 2029, 2030. So a three to four year delay. That is correct. Okay. As it relates to the Ontario line, some of the questions we have, we've heard about some of the benefits, some of the questions. Do we know, I'll go to either the D, our DCM, Tracy, uh, or TTC, what percentage design was the relief line at? Our previous plan, the relief line. Through the chair, the relief line was between 15 and 20% design. 15 to 20%. The Ontario line, what percentage of design is the overall Ontario line? The new sections in the north and the downtown west, as well as the central section, what percentage design is it at? Uh, through the chair, what they quote near their business case is between 0 and 10%. 0 and 10%. So what are some of the unknowns given that we are at a reduced level of design? Do we know in the downtown west the depth required to tunnel underneath Queen Street over to Bathurst, for example? Just through the chair, uh, uh, the province has made it quite clear that that won't be known until they actually go out and actually bring a contractor on board because they will actually be doing the design. The only design that's done to date is as a representative alignment design that's been done to date. Okay, so has any geotechnical uh, analysis been done for the new sections of this line? Through the chair, not that I'm aware of. Okay. Uh, some, some other questions I have, again, I'll go to the DCM or the TTC. Uh, who will maintain the Ontario line, the actual maintenance of this new line? 
Uh, so through you, Madam Speaker, certainly there's been a fair amount of discussion in regards to maintenance, whether it be day-to-day -day versus life cycle maintenance. Uh, one of the things that we do have as a takeaway from today is to craft the operating and maintenance agreements with the province, uh, with the TTC obviously in the province, similarly to what we're doing right now with Eglinton Crosstown. So do, do we, do we, so it is to be determined what the maintenance model will be, is that correct? That is correct. Okay. And then on fair integration, uh, so this line, the Ontario line would be operated by the TTC, is that correct? That's correct. Do we have any commitment or guarantee that the fares will be set by the TTC and integrated with the rest of the system? Uh, so through you, Madam Speaker, not to that specificity. Certainly there's a great deal of discussion around fare integration and how do we mobilize people across the GTA, uh, so that will be subject to further discussions. Okay, those are all my questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Wang Tam. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. With respect to a follow-up question regarding uh, maintenance, and, uh, and I think the, the answer was that it is to be determined, when will we know uh, who will operate uh, and, and maintain these lines in the, in the long term? Is there an anticipated date? Uh, so through you, Madam Speaker, we don't have a set date. Certainly, there are a myriad of agreements that need to be struck between ourselves and the province and, and between ourselves and the agencies. Uh, operating and maintenance, while we have noted that the TTC does have day-to-day -day operations and maintenance, uh, the big discussion comes around life cycle maintenance, uh, the setting of service level standards, and how those arrangements work across the variety of different types of lines that are being developed. And, sh and so just to dive that into that a little bit further, should we know before we make any final arrangements? Uh, so through you, Madam Speaker, I think we're at a point where we know sufficiently what we need to know in order to advance building the projects. Uh, this is, as I'll reference, not dissimilar to the approach taken with Eglinton Crosstown, where we are currently in the discussions on operating and maintenance agreements. And so with respect to, uh, so we'll put that aside for now, um, but with respect to incremental costs on any new technology um, versus, uh, and if it not, not being comp compatible with exi existing technology, what would be that price differential? That, w that we can absorb. Uh, so through you, Madam Speaker, the fact is the sole responsibility projects, and particularly we we'll use the Ontario line where they're speaking about a different technology, those costs are 100% borne by the province. That's inclusive of any um, maintenance storage facility or anything else they require. And when, when the technology is not compatible, who pays for that? That through you, Madam Speaker, that's the province. And, uh, and if, it's, uh, if it's not possible to make it compatible? Uh, so through you, Madam Speaker, again, you know, there's a difference in the lines. Certainly when we're speaking to, and I all look to the TTC to chime in, but we're extensions to line two and line one, the expectation is that technology must be compatible with the existing systems. The Ontario line as a standalone, that's less of a concern. And the Eglinton West LRT naturally would follow with the Eglinton Crosstown. And do we have any cost projections to how much it will cost to maintain? Re recognizing we don't know who's going to maintain and who's going to who's going to have that, that final fi uh, fiscal responsibility, uh, but do we know the anticipated cost to maintain? Uh, through you, Madam Speaker, no. We're too early in the design phase to be able to determine that at this point. And, and when can we expect that information? Uh, so through you, Madam Speaker, I would suggest as the projects individually progress and we have a better picture of what the capital construction is, uh, depending on how the province procures as well, it will be getting to those types of numbers that the province is taking on at a later point but I, I don't foresee it in the next year. And because we've purchased trains, buses, as well as uh, streetcars in Toronto, uh, Ontario uh, a number of times, uh, and, and, uh, and I think that uh, some of them have seen technical failings, uh, the, uh, the, the lack of per, uh, ability to, to deliver on time, uh, will that change our procurement model in this case so we can avoid some of those prior failings? Uh, so through you, Madam Speaker, I, I won't speak to the current state with the TTC, but certainly in regards to these four projects, uh, the costs related to are those of the province, and the procurement approach is a decision to be made by the province. Do, I don't, I don't know if TTC. If if the procurement approach, uh, as outlined by the province, does not deliver success for the city of Toronto, because we've seen where procurements have actually delivered failure, product not delivered, services uh, expected not rendered. Uh, what, how will we anticipate, because it's announcements have been made and it's been promised to them, how can we influence that? Great question. So through you, Madam Speaker, I think that really articulates, Councillor, the importance of the city being involved 
uh, from where we are now through the design phase and right through to implementation, uh, our ability to influence and, uh, and express the city's interests and concerns and what we want to see done, uh, that's, where, that's where we sit and staying at the table is critical for that. So it's, it's basically influencing them by conversation? Yeah, I mean, through you, Madam Speaker, we've had a commitment of collaboration in the design work. Uh, you know, that we've, I would say over the last number of months, there's been a considerable amount of um, good work done and good collaboration done. We have tremendous expertise, particularly within the TTC, uh, tremendous expertise in planning, in our city planning group and others. Uh, and I believe that the, the expertise that these individuals have brought has been listened to and will continue to be listened to. And for the communities that will be directly yes, thank you. For the communities that will be directly impacted by the, by construction, the relocation of these lines, uh, and uh, and the expropriation that's required to uh, to acquire the real estate, um, how will how will those communities be further consulted and engaged through this process, knowing that they've already gone through lengthy public consultations, they've given us their feedback? How do we ensure that we're not going to fatigue them with another conversation about a new line, new technology, new placement of, uh, okay, of service? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so through you, Madam Speaker, I would say that the topic of consultation uh, has been significantly placed. Certainly it's referenced in the terms of reference that guided our table, as well as the commitment uh, from the province going forward. They will have that responsibility to ensure consultation is done in the development of the projects. Again, I would say with our involvement and our continuous uh, reinforcement of the importance of engaging the community, I think they've also had experience with the Crosstown where things don't go so well maybe if that's not done properly. Uh, so I have no reason to believe that there will not be uh, a decent and a comprehensive consultation process and we will continue to advocate for that. Thank you. Councillor Cole. Yeah, thank you. A question to the Chief Planner. Uh, I'm uh, very concerned about uh, the timelines given for the relief uh, dash Ontario line and when it's going to offer relief on the Young Line, Line 1, especially at the North York Centre, Young and Eglinton, and uh, Young and Bloor. Is it reasonable for us as a council to ask uh, that the city manager and his team request for a delay in implementing uh, Bill 108 upzoning, Midtown and Focus, uh, uh, which is gone, upzoning? until the uh, relief line is operational. Uh, through the speaker, the, uh, as uh, Council knows, the Minister has amended and, uh, and approved uh, the Young and Eglinton Plan, OPA 405. In that approval, uh, there are policy changes that uh, increase the potential for more density than Council uh, endorsed. Uh, so that, that continues to be a uh, point of implementation for the city as we continue to re review development in Young and Eglinton. And I would share the concern that we already have uh, difficult congestion issues and growth management issues in Young and Eglinton. Uh, and we will have to closely monitor that uh, path of growth over the next 5, 10, 15 years in Young and Eglinton and take uh, interim steps, if you will, through uh, uh, measures that the TDC can deploy with improved bus service, but also be mindful of the use of other tools that we may need to use. Certainly bringing it to the attention of the province that uh, the Ontario line and indeed an extension of the Ontario line north of Eglinton are important uh, projects to keep uh, building and build diligently in order to address the growth pressure that we've got already at Young and Eglinton. And then on top of the growth pressures, we have another uh, growth pressure happening in two years. As you know, the Eglinton Crosstown is going to be unloading uh, thousands more uh, riders at Young and Eglinton uh, in the very near at that time. So we've got the growth pressures uh, that exist. Then we've got the upzoning and the uh, coming of the Crosstown uh, unloading passengers at Young and Eglinton. Don't you think? Those are other reasons combined uh, to where we should be asking for some kind of deferral on the upzoning by the province until we are, reass we are sure that that uh, relief line is well underway or completed uh, whenever. 
Uh, through the speaker, I, I don't know that it's, it's something that uh, council may wish to at least put on the record that uh, it has uh, a concern that we, that the commitment to the Ontario line is uh, solid and that we continue to work uh, as staff to diligently uh, match the infrastructure that we need to support that growth with the approvals that council is considering in Young and Eglinton. I think we have some tools to, uh, to, to manage the situation in the interim, but certainly council making it abundantly clear to the province that the commitment to the Ontario line up to Eglinton and beyond over the next 15, 20 years is an essential part of building out the network and supporting uh, the growth that we're seeing already at Young and Eglinton. Thank you. I just a quick question of the TTC. Uh, my question is, in terms of the uh, Relief Line Dash Ontario Line, uh, when is the uh, completion date supposedly uh, that the province uh, is committing to? Through the chair, uh, the province have actually said it would be finished in 2027. Now, don't you think that's very optimistic considering they still haven't revealed the secret technology they're going to use, that it's going to interface with uh, the already existing heavy rail lines on Bloor, the heavy rail line on Young, and the LRT technology. How, do you think that's realistic, 2027, for completion of this brand new secret technology, this mammoth new $11 billion line? Uh, through the speaker, it's very difficult for us to make that assessment because as part of the, the conversations we've had with the province, we did ask them for their detailed schedule and how they actually got there. Uh, they openly admitted they didn't have one at that point in time, so it's very difficult for us to assess that. That, that was your last question. Thank you. Councillor Thompson. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Speaker, and I want to thank Councillor Cressy for asking a lot of Scarborough questions that I now don't have to ask. Thank you, Councillor Cressy. Um, but I would like to ask this Scarborough question. Um, I think of the TTC. Uh, in view of the fact that um, in the line of questioning to Councillor Cressy, uh, there is a three-year uh, addition because of the process for the uh, extension of the Bloor Danforth to Scarborough. Um, can you tell me how that then equates with respect to the shelf life of the SRT? And what is the process in terms of um, yeah. the plan for the SRT? I mean, on uh, BRTs, what will, how many buses will we see during that time of the construction? Uh, through, through you, Madam Chair, uh, right now the TTC has undertaken an operation and a technical assessment of the SRT to make a judgment on its extended life. Uh, we'll be reporting out to the board in uh, late second quarter of next year on that, as well as uh, part of the five-year service plan that we're looking at, we'll do an assessment of uh, the possible options should the uh, extension of that life be limited. Okay, thank you. Um, can somebody tell me then, with respect to the RFQ, RFP for uh, the tunneling contract and so on, uh, for the extension of the Blue or Danforth line, when would that take place as part of the uh, iteration of this plan? Uh, so through you, Madam Speaker, that is something that we are discussing with the province or will be discussing in any opportunities to uh, do some early works, including uh, releasing tunnel contracts. So it is being dis will be getting discussed. Okay. Um, Mr. City Manager, we've had many discussions on this issue here. Um, there is the uh, reports that you brought forward encouraging us to take a seat at the table to discuss this issue to ensure that we are at a, uh, an agreement and or an understanding or better understanding in terms of how we work forward. Could you help us enlighten us as to the process that you went through and, um, and, and your views and feelings as to where we are today going forward? So if I can, through uh, the speaker, uh, you had given us direction back in December uh, to be at a table. Uh, gave us direction to develop a terms of reference to govern the table and set out very clearly the, the issues that you felt needed to be addressed uh, to the satisfaction of this council. Uh, those are our marching orders. Uh, there's an executive that involves Michael Lindsay, who's a special uh, 
uh, manager of, the, of this file for the Premier, uh, Deputy Minister of Transportation and others, and we meet on a fairly regular basis to make sure that the understandings of each other is, uh, is discussed and well understood. So that table is, uh, is driven by the terms of reference that you, per, you uh, approved, the issues that you've identified, and that's why we are where we are today. So there's, uh, there's reason why we remain uh, not just optimistic, but I think convinced that the conversations will continue to work in a very positive way. Um, we are an interest-based driven table, uh, which means that uh, we do spend a fair bit of time understanding the other's perspectives and try to ensure that what we bring forward to our respective decision-making bodies um, meets the needs of those bodies. So it's worked very well to this point in time. Um, we certainly have a lot more work to do uh, as we move into the designs and the execution of these projects. Okay, thank you. Um, there were some uh, questions and comments that were made at the Executive Committee regarding uh, the tunneling and underground, I think it's Gerard area and so on where the residents came forward. As part of the process, that's being reviewed and that's being discussed in terms of the discussion table that you're a part of? Through the speaker, absolutely. All right, and I think my final question, I perhaps to the TTC or staff to answer. The Ontario line and the DRL, it seems to me that the Ontario line covers a lot more ground. Would you agree? Uh, through the chair, the Ontario line has a western extension, which the relief line did not have. Right. And the Ontario line goes north of the Danforth, uh, which the first phase of the relief line did not have. Right, and so this Ontario line captures, though, uh, areas like I think Flemington and, and Thorn, Thorncliffe in, in that area that are now challenged with respect to transit uh, services? Uh, through the chair, that is correct compared to the original Relief Line South project. Right. The Relief Line North project would have looked at service to those areas as well. Um, there are many different types of equipment uh, that could be utilized. Is this a worry for you now as long as we have the appropriate equipment that will service the Ontario line? Uh, through the that chair, was your last question. Yes, thank through, you, Speaker. Through the chair, our main concern at the TTC is that the Ontario line, or whatever is built, provides sufficient relief to line one. And uh, the uh, information and understanding we have today is that they are proposing trains that are large enough to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Ford. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. So I'd like to uh, start off with questioning the appropriate staff on the, on the, the, uh, the beginning of the report. So you mentioned that uh, we have uh, state of good repair and our growth needs adding up to roughly about $33 billion. Um, what is our current, what is the state of good repair number of that total, breakdown of that total that the city currently has right now? Uh, sure, Madam Chair. The entire $33.5 billion need for the next 15 years is uh, a, a total view of state of good repair, life cycle maintenance, replacement costs, as well as minor growth. Right, and do we have that particular number of what we're expecting over the next 15 years? Um, Out of that? $24 billion of, of that is not oh, funded so today. So that total number would be that. Okay, and under this uh, kind of preliminary agreement we have with the province, um, it is free enough about five to six billion dollars of the city's contribution to transit that they have so that we could put that into state of good repair. Um, is that a significant step forward um, for the TTC in your opinion? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, when the TTC released the capital investment plan in January, the intent was to start the discussions on the needs for funding. And nine months later, I'm very pleased that, that uh, it looks like the redirection of funding will be made available. And moving on to page seven of the report, um, understanding the current PTIF funding that has been put forward to the City of Toronto, and with the current uh, dynamics uh, with the federal government um, uh, supporting uh, this initiative, um, is that in any way going to affect how we approach our PTIF funding um, that we're receiving to the City of Toronto? Have we gotten any idea of how that will be affected in any way, shape, or form, added to, taken away? Uh, speaker, we're in fact uh, nominating um, for federal funding the two uh, projects, the Ontario line, um, as well as the Scarborough East line. Mm -hmm. And so it should, uh, you know, that is the uh, rec recommendation of staff uh, that council nominate those two projects for federal funding. 
Right. So um, here it, it states that in order to get the $2.16 2, $2 billion in funding, we would be matching that. But now we are putting current capital funding towards state of good repair, correct? Yes, that's correct. And the province will be funding uh, the amount that the city would have otherwise right. contributed. Okay. Excellent. Um, and then, uh, particularly to the Eglinton West LRT specifically, um, in the report it states that not too much work has been done to date. Um, what can we expect for uh, Eglinton West in the coming months and years? And is there any uh, timeline staff have on that? Through the speaker, we don't have firm timelines from Met Metrolinx on their work on Eglinton West. We know that they are working on updating their business case analysis on that, but we have not been uh, uh, given that or our timeline. Okay, excellent. Um, and then uh, moving on to page, I believe I had it on uh, page, I think it was the, the planning part of the report. I can't seem to find it here. I knew I had it written down. But as the, the, the plans have changed or the province has put forth new transit plans, of course, um, it is affecting a number of new neighborhoods in the city of Toronto. And um, how are city planning going to approach uh, the planning aspects of this? And, and what's going to change on our end on how we look at urban planning in these new communities that this is being proposed to go through? Uh, through the speaker, the, the plans uh, generally accord with the city's official plan. The Ontario line, as did the relief line north and south, generally accord with where the city plans for growth. The, uh, the uh, extension uh, to Scarborough accords with the city's desire to create a large centre at Scarborough Centre. Uh, the, the, uh, so in a, in a general sense, that, that is uh, something that uh, contributes to our support for these priority projects. The, uh, at a more discrete level, a tangible level on the ground, the city uh, and the province have been discussing entering into an MOU that will guide us and the various roles and responsibilities that both the province and the city have in achieving transit-oriented development in close proximity to the transit stations. So both at a macro level and a, and a micro level, uh, that's how we're proceeding with the, the, the overall relationship between land use development and the transit uh, projects. That was your last question. Thank you. Um, Councillor Fletcher, questions? Let me use the overhead speaker. Pardon? Let me use the overhead speaker. Oh, okay. Okay, you ready? Okay. If um, hold on, hold on. Can we get the uh, the mic? Oh, okay. Just a sec. I'll I'll redo your time. Down there. No, you don't. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. I just, this is a configuration uh, of what would be the all of the tracks going from three to six and the Ontario line going in the two kilometers uh, through my ward above ground. I just want to confirm with our staff that the existing is currently three tracks. Who would like to confirm that? Through the speaker, that is correct, Councillor. I think, and then the fourth track would be the RER track, correct? Through the speaker, that's correct. And then the other two tracks would be the Ontario line tracks. So just to confirm the requirement for the track width in order to have a safe running of the new trains in a heavy rail situation, that there has to be six meters between this is the city standard or the TTC standard for safety is a six meters between the Ontario line trains and the current GO trains. Is that right? 
through the speaker. That's correct. When you, when you ask, our standard states that when you use mixed modes of railway cars, are you heavy rail, which is the go, and you look at Metro, which is the TTC, there is a six metres between centres. That's correct. And does Metrolinx agree with that? We haven't had that conversation. We haven't had that. Mr. Teugel, does Metrolinx agree with that, our safety standard, or not? Uh, through you, Madam Speaker, at this point in time, we haven't had that confirmed by Metrolinx. And then, this is our safety standard, though. You're confirming that. This is our current safety standard. It is the, safety. It's through you, Madam Speaker, it is the TTC standard. So the city standard as well, then. We, do we have a different standard than the TTC? Th through you, Madam Speaker, it is the same. It's the TTC standard, city standard. Thank you. And then a minimum 3.5 meters to residential, and then there would have to be some mitigating circumstances. Bringing that corridor up to about 36 or 37 meters minimum in order to run the trains above ground. Have I got that computation right? Through the speaker, uh, roughly you're right. It's, the minimum would be 30, around about 36 meters. 36 meters, okay. Um, there are six bridges on the Ontario line that I'm showing here, the two kilometers. There's a bridge at Eastern, Queen, Dundas, Logan, Carlaw, and Girard. And there is also work that's contemplated for the Gardner Expressway. I'm going to ask the Deputy City Manager that to take down the Gardner, we have to expand the bridge at Lakeshore over the Don River, correct? Through the Speaker, that's correct. And even now, in order to undertake the flood protection, there's work that has to take place on that bridge. Through the speaker, that's correct. Is Metrolinx aware of that? Um, I can confirm we've had many detailed discussions with them, and I'm sure that they're aware that there's significant investment needs to be made, so I would say yes. I'm just looking at the impact on commuters, mostly from Scarborough in the east, as well as any transit operations and fleet. Have we looked at that yet, or is that still to come? Through, through you, Madam Speaker, that is still yet to come. So if I was to ask staff to expedite that so it can be part of the TPAP, would that be possible, the environmental uh, assessment? Uh, certainly through you, Madam Speaker. We are discussing the, the confluence of a lot of very large construction projects that are happening along this corridor and centering in around East Harbour. Uh, we have not extended to have that conversation with our city operations folks yet. I don't know that it's necessarily a part of the TPAP process per se, but the work that needs to be done will be done. But the city could do that work and have the TPAP informed by that, by our conclusions, assuming there was a problem or not. Correct? Uh, certainly, through you, Madam Speaker, I would suggest that any work that the city has done is going to be uh, used to inform these projects. Or will do. Absolutely. So if I'm to show you these bridges that currently exist, the Gerard Bridge is currently 18 metres. The new track would be 36 metres. Um, using my math, that's basically doubling the size of that bridge and many of the other bridges. I would have to assume there'd be a fairly significant uh, impact on the transit on Gerard Street and any other, any other bridge for travel, whether you're a car driver or take transit. Oh, through you, Madam Speaker, absolutely. Thank you. And last is just a question to um, Mr. Lintern. Uh, on, we have a, the city, um, the province has mandated growth at different stations. If there's going to be a station, there has to be a certain amount of density. Has anybody looked at the impact at Riverdale Plaza of adding portals to the future development opportunities there, that the portals would go down in the, at the middle of Riverdale Plaza? That was your last uh, question. Through the speaker, uh, no, that has not been specifically considered yet. As we know, the line is a representative uh, line, but we're, we would be very much interested in understanding the, the impact of the development opportunity at the Riverdale well, Plaza. So I'll be asking you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Councillor Matlow. You. Madam Speaker, I'd like to know what was the provincial cost estimate for the province's plan for the, the Crosstown West extension? What is the provincial cost estimate for the province's plan for the Crosstown West? They're, they're talking about, through the speaker, about, uh, about $5 billion. $5 billion. What was the most recent cost estimate for option one 
10 stop Crosstown West extension. It was around $1.82 billion. $1.8. What was the most recent estimate for the provincial three-stop Scarborough subway? Through the chair, 5.5 billion. 5.5 billion. What was the most recent cost estimate for the Crosstown East extension to University of Toronto Scarborough campus? Of the, of the provincial? Yeah. We don't have uh, a provincial figure. Ours the was city one. around, again, around $2 billion. $2 billion. And how many new transit riders is the Crosstown West projected to serve? Pardon me, Councillor, could you repeat the question? How many new transit riders is the Crosstown West projected to serve? Through the speaker, about 5,500. 5,500. And how many new transit riders is the three-stop Scarborough extension expected to serve? Uh, through the chair, about 11,000 new riders each weekday. Sorry, say it again. About 11,000 new riders each weekday. 11,000. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Ainsley. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Through you to the Deputy City Manager, Cook. Um, in the report, uh, it discusses uh, a $2.1 billion um, amount of money that could be put towards other transit projects. In Scarborough, people have been saying to me, you can move that to the Eglinton East LRT if you wanted to. But currently, that $2.1 billion is unfunded, correct? Through you, Madam Speaker, that is correct. And the other issue around that is that further in the report, it also mentions that as we decide what to do with that money, once we do have a source for it, we have to meet the provincial demand or need that we have to provide credible progress on our state of good repair. Uh, certainly through you, Madam Speaker, the, the concern around the $33.5 billion state of good repair needs for TTC has been a very front and center discussion that we've been having, and yes, there is a commitment to significant investment in addressing state of good repair. And the, the current estimate now on the Eglinton East LRT to University of Toronto Scarborough is? Through the speaker, around $2 billion, Councillor. And that's in 2019 dollars? Uh, yes, that's correct. Okay. And to the Deputy City Manager, currently we have a, an infrastructure reserve fund for transit that we're working on that has about $200 million in it. Uh, through you, Madam Speaker, if you're speaking to the, the uh, dedicated levy, and the, yes, there is. That's about $200 million? About right? $118 million approximately, I think, the start of this year. And how much does the city put into that fund each year through the budget? I believe it's approximately $80 million. I can No, Joe Farag will answer for me. Um, that fund uh, yields approximately $41 million annually. Annually? Yes. Okay. All right. And then uh, for the TTC, I'm, I'm looking at some clarification around our, our service, surface network. In the, the report that's before us now, um, the, it doesn't really address the role of the surface network for local transportation as a feeder system. And I'm also asking that in the context of Scarborough, where 60% of the, the ridership doesn't get on the subway or to go out of Scarborough. It depends on a bus and transit network in Scarborough, but doesn't clearly, this report doesn't address any of that. Through the chair, uh, the, the importance of uh, excellent transit connections to the Ontario line and to the line to extension are very clear and have been very clearly stated by the TTC and by the city during our, our discussions with Metrolinx. There is a mention in the report of that. Uh, we clearly have identified that we need to have very good connections between buses, streetcars, and the trains on the Ontario Line and Line 2 East Extension. And of course, uh, having appropriately sized uh, bus terminals at, uh, at the, the major intersection, uh, major, major interchanges is also very important. Okay, and that also kind of ties into my next question. Um, throughout the report on, you know, roughly pages 17 to 22, there's a lot of discussion um, around what the projected detail is projected demands going to be? Is there going to be a detailed report coming out on the projected demands and how that affects 
these four transit projects that we're looking at or the province is looking at building and how that demand is going to rearrange itself as those projects come online? Certainly, through the speaker, certainly, councillor, that we will be regularly updating our modelling uh, of the impacts of these as we get more of these lines, as we get more details. And are you going to be reporting on that publicly? That's going to be a regular progress the, report to at, City Council? Through the speaker as part of the updates to City Council that this report uh, recommends, we will uh, and can include updates on, on modelling on the lines as, uh, as we get more details. Oh. Okay, and then uh, do we have any numbers around, so the provincial gas tax that we receive, I believe it's about, Mr. Frag, $180 million a year? Uh, through the speaker, I think it's $165 million a year. $165, okay. And so when we look at um, the four province's four projects are going to be paid for by three P3 financing uh, for the most part, and there's a, a reference in the report about using the existing network fare box revenue to defray operating costs. But we're have, as we bring these four projects online and we're going to uh, be looking after them or operating them, is, is that fare box revenue, is there an estimated gap of what the fare box revenue is going to be versus the operating costs for <coughs> those four lines? So, so the agreement contemplates that uh, fare box revenue would flow to uh, offset operating costs. The operating costs on the four lines have yet to be determined. Over the course of the next uh, couple of years, we're going to be assessing those, uh, those needs. Um, and I should also mention, you are correct, on the provincial gas tax, it is, in fact, 185. We receive federal gas tax as well at a rate of 165 million annually. Thank you. That was your last question. Councillor Bradford. Thanks very much, Madam Speaker. Um, I think this is to the city manager, perhaps. Um, in the P3 model that they um, that was used for the Eglinton Crosstown, um, who did the de detailed design work on on that project? Through you, Madam Speaker, the detailed design uh, work has been done by the project company. Okay. And when was that work initiated, and when was that work completed? The detailed, uh, through you again, uh, Madam Speaker, the detailed design is uh, developed in the early stages of the, uh, of the, procur of the uh, project company's um, uh, contract, and then it continues on throughout uh, the uh, further design development until it's actually uh, ready to be issued uh, through, uh, sorry, uh, for uh, construction documents to be actually developed. So as part of a P3 model, um, the applicants or the bidders are actually advancing detailed design and that's what they're submitting to be evaluated? That is correct. And how far do they typically, is there, um, is there a call from the market f that specifies X percentage of design that needs to be done uh, in order to put forward a bid? Through you again, uh, Madam Speaker, yes. It's typically uh, brought to about the 30% level um, prior to the uh, uh, request for proposal being closed. So. Is it, is it safe to say that we would anticipate detailed design of 30% uh, before a successful bidder was awarded the contract to advance the work in the projects contemplated here? Yes, um, again, through you, Madam Speaker, yes, uh, it is contemplated that using a P3 model that you would see that level of design being completed. So a lot of questions around detailed design uh, that we're all asking, those, it's, it's anticipated that those would be brought forward to at least 30%, which is where we're at on, on relief line and other projects, it would be advanced to that level um, before a contract is awarded. Through you, Madam Speaker, yes, that's correct. Let's talk about the building on that, the cost estimates. Um, who prepares the cost estimates for these projects? Um, through you, Madam Speaker, the uh, cost estimate in the, in, in the initial case, in, sorry, in the initial step is prepared by the, uh, by the city uh, and the TTC and then ultimately by the province who then determines uh, what the actual cost of the project is before it goes out to market. Was that on the, that was the model on the Crosstown or that's what we'll do with these projects? No, the, through again, through the speaker, the, uh, on these projects here, because these are priority projects of the province, they will be doing that. And is it typical, 
that we refine our cost, emit, cost estimates in conjunction with detailed design is that design work is advanced through a project? Through the speaker, yes. Um, and I, in fact, they will as well. Uh, using a stage gate process, they would have to go through a, 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 a increased uh, accuracy uh, or further development of their budget estimates in order to get approval. Is that a class cost estimate process? Uh, typically, it is. Okay. Is that what we would anticipate seeing with these projects in a P3 model? Yes, we would. Okay. So we don't have that information today uh, to, the same to the same extent that we would if we had, say, 30% design. But when it comes forward from the market, we can anticipate as, as City of Toronto to have more detailed information, of course, on the design and, uh, and a better sense of what the cost is going to be. Through you, Madam Speaker, yes, there will be uh, further uh, development of that um, okay. as the project progresses. Okay. I'd like to, thanks very much, I'd like to shift just over to our, our Chief Planner and talk a little bit about transit-oriented development, uh, something discussed extensively here. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about the MOU between the City and the province to work together on transit-oriented development? Uh, through the speaker, uh, just generally, we need to understand specifically how transit-oriented development could play out in association with the various transit stations. Uh, it could play out as a participation by a private developer in the actual development of a station. It could be that it occurs uh, right next door. Uh, in these various scenarios, we want to understand the, the role of the private developer, the role of Metrolinx, and the role of the city. We certainly are very much interested in uh, continuing our role as the planning approval authority, as we do with any other development, and influencing uh, the shape, size, and attributes of those, those developments to build complete communities, and certainly work with, I'm as we normally of the time. do. Sorry to cut you off. You and I would agree that TOD is important to these things. Is there an opportunity for us as a city to shape and inform those TOD conversations around the stations La proposed in the, the plans coming Last forward? Last question. Uh, through the speaker, I'd say yes. The MOU uh, very much would be a place where we will uh, be attempting to articulate the city's view of how TOD should occur and what roles the city continues to enjoy. Thank you. Councillor Grimes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I want to start, I guess uh, the termination now of the Ontario line on the west end will be Ontario, it was, on, it was originally Ontario Place, now it's going to be Exhibition Place. That's correct? Through the Speaker, that is correct. It would be at an Exhibition Station. Exhibition, yeah, okay. Um, now, there's lots of things happening. Metrolinx, that, that platform right now at Exhibition, and I know Councillor Layton will agree with me, it's, it's kind of outright dangerous right now when there's events going on at Exhibition Place and the scene going on. And I think there's design happening already with Metrolinx with regard to that station. There's Dufferin, the 30% design going up for the uh, waterfront um, LRT. We kind of see this probably as going to be a, a mini transit hub at that station with... Uh, Liberty Village, do we not? Through the speaker, yes. With, uh, with several lines coming in there, it becomes a much more significant hub. So what does that mean to the, where we are, the 30% design Dufferin and, and uh, Metrolinx, the work they're doing on that platform now? So, so I'll let Scott. Uh, through the chair, uh, the work uh, the TTC is doing to advance that design is continuing because we don't know the actual effects the Ontario line would have on it. So we are going to wrap up that work early in the new year and then revise it if necessary based on the information we learn about the Ontario line. Okay. The $5 billion that's been kind of thrown out there that will be um, freed up for us, state of good repair was mentioned, um, and then the waterfront LRT was mentioned, that money could go towards, where did that come from? Where did that discussion come that it would be earmarked for, I know state of good repair, um, but where did the waterfront LRT come from? Uh, so through you, Madam Speaker, I don't believe there's any specific reference to the Waterfront LRT in the context of the agreement with the province, though both Waterfront Transit and the Eglinton East LRT are identified as previously stated council priorities. Uh, so in the agreement, we will have a conversation about those, subject to a report from the city manager in 2020, when council sets out its, sets out its priorities for the redirection of those funds, bearing in mind the need to address the state of good repair uh, concerns that we have, and expansion. Great, thanks. Uh, and I guess my last question uh, to my good friend Joel Frag over there. 
I uh, heard him say uh, the, the cost of the operating of the four lines is maybe my last opportunity to ask you a question. But uh, quote unquote, we will be assessing the cost of the operating of the four lines in the next couple of years. Have you said? Yes. Does that mean you're sticking around? <laughs> I'm afraid not. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Speaker. Those are my questions. Thank, thank you. Talk to Meg about it. Let me, let me, I gotta get my head ready. Councillor Carroll. Thanks, Madam Speaker. Um, and, and I'll say it into the microphone. Please stay, Mr. Perret. <laughs> uh, so, so uh, we talked a lot about state of good repair this morning, but I, I don't know that we're all universally on the same page as, as to what that is. What is state of good repair with respect to the TTC budget? Are we talking about track replacement? Are we talking about vehicle buys? That, that big $33 billion egg of which we, we still have $24 billion, I believe, roughly below the line. What is that? That's correct. So they call it as life cycle maintenance replacement. It'll uh, replace tracks and switches and signals. It'll tunnel linings, uh, upcoming need for replacement of buses and, uh, and such like that. So a lot of it is vehicle buys. All of that is in our basic state of good repair program right now. We know we're gonna. We know that within that life cycle, we love our new streetcars. But but by the end of that period of time, we're gonna have to be at least looking at what is the next streetcar. Are we not? By then, we'll be at 15 years from now. The the, the first ones delivered will be 20 to 25 years old. That's correct for you, Chair. It would be at least in midway through the overhaul process, but that is correct, always looking out for the future. And we used to, previously, we used to have vehicle purchase programs, sometimes from the province, sometimes from the, the federal government, but they were very specific. They were, we know you need to replace vehicles, and that's a big one if you're just trying to keep the basic system going, so we'll have a program for that. Uh, that's not contemplated in, in these negotiations, is it? Is that, that's all on us now? No, through you, Madam Speaker, certainly the, the priority in the, in the context of this agreement has been to address the state of good repair and growth-related needs, uh, particularly focused on subway, as that's been identified as significant concern. Uh, there's not been a specific discussion about vehicles. Whether rail or bus, we haven't discussed this. Uh, through you, Madam Chair, in the letter that uh, I provided the city manager that was uh, transmitted to the, the province, it, it does identify um, the items that I previously mentioned, which includes vehicles, uh, line two replacement, for instance. Those vehicles will be 30 years old in 2026. The signal system uh, will be 55, it's 55 years old today. So all that is identified in the CIP that was passed along to the province. So it was identified, it was passed along to them, but their messaging is all state of good repair is yours now. So did they mean the vehicles or not? For you, that, is, that would be seen correct. Go ahead, City Mayor. Through the Speaker, the, yes, the state of good repair is certainly where they, want to foc where they want us to focus our, the dollars that have been freed up from expansion, but also important to say that uh, they will be partners in a conversation with the federal government in terms of what role they might play in assisting with state of good repair. So they might get involved in it. But we, but we don't know in what sense. That would be an accurate statement. So is this negotiation table, is it going to be, uh, I'm mindful of my time, it's going to be an ongoing thing? If we adopt this deal today, we're, we're way not finished. <laughs> am, I, am I right in saying that? Through the speaker, you're absolutely right. Okay, great. So we got a lot more to do. Uh, with respect to operating, um, uh, I get unease with the, with the statement, we're going to let you keep the fare box to offset. Does the fare box offset much now? How much property tax goes into each ride in the TTC today? So through the chair, uh, on our conventional uh, system, it's about uh, just over a dollar that uh, we are subsidizing per ride. Right. So, so we're, we're going to be using the fare box to offset, they say. But the minute, you know, the crosstown will open and then these new lines will open, and for each fare we take in to run that rail, we will take on a cost. We will also have a bigger bill here in our operating budget. Have we not, it's perfect that you have come to the table, Ms. Levita, have we not been promised for a little over 12 years now, since they first announced they would fund Transit City three premiers ago, did they not say, we'll talk about operating in about 18 months, 12 years ago? 
Correct. So is this a condition of this deal? Uh, do we have a timeline for when we're going to talk about it? And could we stick to it this time? Because from Mr. McGinty, from Ms. Wynn to Mr. Ford, we keep saying we will kick the operating can down the road. Do we have terms in this deal that set a timeline for having the operating conversation? Because the fare box ain't going to offset the dollar a ride. That was your last question. Uh, so through you, Madam Speaker, certainly in the terms that are being discussed today in this agreement, it makes a specific reference to the province, the city, and approaching the federal government and looking at tripartite funding for much needed investments. And that does include upgrades, state of good repair. Thank you. Councillor, thank you. Councillor Pasternak. Yes, thank you, Madam Speaker. Speaker, uh, to uh, through you to, to staff, um, when it comes to traffic management uh, during the construction period, will requests for changes in current traffic directional flow come to committee and council, or will the province change legislation and, and make those changes unilaterally? Through the speaker, as is the case with Eglinton Crosstown now, those changes in traffic come through council. We uh, have no sense of the province changing that. Okay, so that'll come through here. Um, expropriation, um, major uh, infrastructure projects usually result in expropriation. We have the Expropriation Act. Are there any moves by the province to change the provisions of that, or is it pretty well status quo throughout the project? So if I can, through the speaker, uh, those, are the, those kinds of matters are going to be discussed with the province right now in terms of their ability to speed up construction of these projects. So that is clearly legislation that they're governed by. It's their legislation. How they choose to address it is something that uh, I'm sure we'll be talking about. So that's a segue into my next question. I think Councillor Carroll touched on it as well. Uh, what we're seeing um, before us today is a framework for negotiation. Uh, does a master agreement come back to us in, on purple pages or what's the next step? master agreement comes back to you. Uh, my goal is always to be uh, in public and as transparent as humanly possible. Okay. Um, I asked this question in committee, but I think it's, it's worthy of asking again. Civic improvements, um, uh, when we've done some Metrolinx projects in the past, uh, we were shocked after these fully funded projects uh, sent us a bill for $90 million <laughs> for civic improvements. Are we protected in the framework going forward uh, that um, we, we won't be on the hook for civic improvements or they'll be mutually negotiated? Through the speaker, um, as I uh, answered at committee, the, uh, the projects will all have a negotiated budget for civic or public realm improvements. Um, and, and other kinds of improvements where the city may have a cost, we ex would expect to be involved in negotiating uh, or confirming the details of those, um, as opposed to being surprised by a bill. So that's, that's on a case-by-case -case basis, a negotiated resolution? Those sorts, of, those sorts of things happen on a project-by-project -project basis, yes. Okay, All right, fair enough. Um, Design work. Um, we've done. A, uh, we've poured millions into the uh, what was once, I guess, the downtown relief line. Now it's the Ontario line redux. Um, cost recovery on design work. Is there any arrangement to 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 recover some of the sunk costs that we put in on on that project? Uh, through you, Madam Speaker, there is a commitment that the province will undertake with us a financial review and reconciliation and look at reimbursing reasonable costs incurred uh, from the work done by the city and TTC previously. So you'll be reporting back on that. And um, environmental assessments, they are long, uh, they are expensive, uh, but I've, I understand the province is going to expedite the environmental assessment process. Um, if you could confirm whether that is correct. And, and, and secondly, whether, whether that um, new policy of getting these done quicker and less expensive will also uh, cover other infrastructure projects that we're trying to get done around the city. So uh, through the speaker, to your first question, uh, I have no details to share with you right now in terms of uh, all the efforts that they're going to undertake to speed up the construction of these projects and specifically in terms of environmental assessment. Um, in terms of your second question, if you could just repeat it quickly. 
Well, uh, whether, we can, whether we can use the same approach of expediting and keeping the cost down on environmental assessments to move it under, under other areas of what we do here, including stormwater management, uh, basement flooding, uh, construction projects that require environmental assessments, and we wait and we wait yeah. and we wait. Yeah, we I, the nature of the conversation that we're having is specific to th these transit projects. I don't think there's an expectation that we'll be unilaterally able to uh, extend whatever relief is, is provided to other infrastructure. Okay, okay. Thank, thank you, you very you. much. Deputy Mayor Menawong. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. This is for Mr. Leary and Mr. Pertula, whoever wishes to answer. Um, in your opinion, uh, is the Ontario Line a viable project? For you, Madam Chair, yes, it's a viable option. And to what extent does it provide relief to Line 1? I can tell you that uh, having the assessment of the issues that we have on a daily basis with the overcrowding on Line 1, it extends the uh, capacity to 2041. And um, so it provides, uh, so do you agree that it provides more relief to, to line one than the relief line south has approved? Three, Madam Chair, that is correct. Okay. And uh, do you know how much more relief is provided by the Ontario line? Uh, through the chair, uh, the Ontario line by traveling north of the Danforth uh, provides about uh, 700 additional uh, persons of relief uh, on line one north of uh, Bloor Young Station. And um, do you know how far along the planning was for the re relief line north? Through the speaker, uh, planning work on relief line north was still in very early stages, looking at a number of different optional corridors. Yeah. Um, my, my, I saw, uh, a, uh, is it true that you, you actually hadn't even decided on what the proper path was. I saw four or five differ different options for what the relief line would look like. Through the speaker, we had not yet selected one corridor. That is correct. So no, you, you even had to decide, you hadn't decided where it was even going to be built. Uh, through the speaker, we had uh, a general sense and the, the Ontario line certainly follows one of the options that we were looking at for relief line north, but, but council had made go no decision Going up O'Connor Drive, one option going up Victoria Park. You hadn't even decided which of those lines. It was so preliminary, you hadn't even decided what, what Through path the speaker, we had not yet brought a recommendation for Council's decision on the, uh, on the corridor, no. Right. And this particular option has a firm decisions, and so it will get, it would be built far, it will be built, or it's planned to be built, far faster than we would have been able to do it. Through the speaker, certainly the uh, the projected timeline for construction is sooner than we anticipated for Relief Line North. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Holliday. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I think through to the city manager, I just, I want to understand just how radical the plans are in front of us. Could you, could you explain to me, it, it, is the Ontario line proposed, is it similar to the Eglinton Crosstown? I mean, it's, it's built by Metrolinx, right? Uh, through the speaker, yes. The overall concept is not unlike the Eglinton Crosstown. And the province is building it, essentially, Metrolinx. Through the speaker, correct. They're going to own it. Correct. Is that any different from the Ontario line? That is the Ontario line. Yeah. No, I mean, they're, they're similar. They're similar. Okay. Yeah. Um, somebody brought up this, this idea about um, subsidy. Right? It, it costs more to run the subways. You know, I got my Presto card there. I laugh at the name always, Presto. You swipe it and the money goes from my account to the cities. Um, how much is the province subsidizing the, the uh, crosstown? Uh, from, from an operating standpoint? From operating, maintenance? Uh, those are details that are being worked out, but to my understanding, uh, the operating is uh, certainly on our back. Uh, Us. Yes. Okay. And, and, but there's a pattern here that, that there's a process to work out the maintenance agreements right. with the Eglinton Cross Town. Are we contemplating the same thing with the Ontario line? Uh, yes, but I, I would hope we do it sooner. Any idea why we didn't demand 
operating when we approve the Eglinton Crosstown operating subsidy? What was that? Uh, through the speaker, uh, I think you raise a very important point. Um, uh, hindsight being what it is, uh, these are the kinds of conversations that I think we want to have at the table at the province right now. So, you know, the other nifty thing is, yeah, I said presto, it comes out of my account into somebody else's, but you know, I pay my transit fare. We, we have extended our uh, Spadina subway into York. And, and what's being discussed is another extension. So it's not that radical. We've done it before. Am I paying for the operating subsidy of serving the nice people that live up in Vaughan and in York Region? Uh, I think through the speaker, I think you are, yes. Are they giving us anything? Well, they certainly work in Toronto. So, I mean, they're certainly supporting the local <laughs> employment scene. And, and, but, but my point is, though, that there isn't an operating uh, and um, a maintenance subsidy from them. It's, it's, on, the, it's no, on my it, Presto card and on my tax bill somewhere. Correct. I mean, through the speaker, you're absolutely correct, though. Uh, the province, though, will be expecting to sit down with those municipalities and look at the full range of costs that they should be expected to bear, uh, whether it be related to the building or the operation and maintenance of it. And th that's in the new, the new proposal before us, though. So that sets the Young Line extension apart from the Spadina Line is, it sounds like we've got a chance now to negotiate some money from the municipalities that we will serve, perhaps even Mississauga or Peel Region, because there's to be an extension out that way as well. Yes, I mean, those were very specific conversations we had at the table, uh, believing that there would be an expectation from this council that others who are benefiting from these projects would pay. This is really important intergovernmental work that you're doing, the team is doing, yeah. right? And, and this is, I mean, we're talking about technology and subway lines and maps here, but there's also this notion about policy between the two governments about who pays for what. And I guess the point I just want to make sure that I fully understand and, and leave with is, you know, we've got a good pattern set with the Eglinton Crosstown. Um, the province is building that, the province is building the Ontario line. Um, th there isn't an operating subsidy, but we've agreed that there's an interest in transit and that we're going to make it work. Um, you know, as a councillor, should I, I've seen, I'm happy with what I'm seeing with the Eglinton Crosstown, should I expect the same with the Ontario line because of, because the pattern's there and you've got something to go on, you've got a relationship with the government already and can we expect those sorts of things to continue with this? Through the speaker, they'll continue, but as I say, I think some, we've learned from the Eglinton Crosstown, so I would expect that we would, do things maybe a bit faster and uh, be a little bit more precise with some of the interests that we have. Well, and so maybe what you're saying is, is we'll do even better with the Ontario line because of our experience and maybe the province has had the same experience as well. I'm not talking about the, the political side, but the people that work with the city to deliver these projects. That, that there, there, There's already a pattern out there, there's experience out there, and it, although it's got a different label and maybe a different technology, the project idea is the same. It's a big civil work. Is that your question? Through the speaker, I believe that's correct. And there's yeah. my answer. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Councillor Lai. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The extension Scarborough, the Scarborough subway extension for the one stop, uh, the estimated opening date is 2026 to 2027. Is that correct? Through the chair, that's correct. And the three stop, uh, when is ex uh, the uh, expectation to be open? It's between 2029 and 2030. So there will be probably about two or three years delay. Yes, that's correct. Has there been any discussion at the table uh, that they are going to open th this up in, uh, in phases? When the first stop is finished, the, the other word, you know, when the first stop is finished, then they can open it and then they can open the next door, uh, the next two. Through the chair, that's one of the discussions we're going to be having with the province and how they can actually accelerate the design and also the implementation. But there is no strategy out there at this point in time saying they're going to open it in phases. Are, there, uh, are they going to be using the same design as we've done on the, the one stop or are they going to be using different design? Through the chair, they're currently re-evaluating the design that was undertaken on the one stop to look to see what elements that, which could be used with the three stop design. 
So they will be referring to the, the one-stop design before they go to a brand new design, is that correct? They will, they will look at what was actually done over that period of time on the one-stop and they may or may not incorporate some of that design into their design. We've still got to see that and that's the discussions that we're going to have with the province and how we actually accelerate the design to ensure we actually bring the delivery date forward. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Layton. Yes, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Um, the capacity of line one, what, what was the capacity of the relief line, the anticipated capacity of the relief line? Uh, through the chair, uh, our, our plans for the relief line called for a conventional six car long, 138 meter, 138 meter long subway train, similar to what we run on line one. And if we were able to operate that every 90 seconds at a most maximum uh, frequency, we'd be able to carry about 44,000 people per hour. And the Ontario line, what's been presented to us, which is limited, but what, or what are we anticipating? What would go in the RFP for the Ontario line? So the information we've seen in the initial business case produced by the province suggests a, a total capacity, a maximum capacity on the Ontario line of about 34,000 people per hour. Did I hear, I heard a number 2041 earlier, that the, the, the life of line one or capacity on line one would be able to be maintained for a certain number of years. I, I don't know what that was in reference to. Uh, through the chair, our, the ridership projections done by the city and by Metrolinx show that line one would be at its maximum capacity of about 36,000 people by 2041. If we do nothing? Uh, if we, uh, th th that ridership increase comes from uh, existing development that's happening along Young Street, it happens, uh, it comes from the line one extension and also comes from other, other developments along there. So, so in almost any case, we would be full on line one in 2041. But is that in, with a scenario that we build the Ontario line? That's correct. That's with the Ontario line providing some degree of relief, particularly south of Bloor Youngstown. And, and what happens when we build the relief line? What, what would the, 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 life time, uh, the extended life be? Uh, the, the relief line itself, just the relief line south, would have provided similar relief south of Blue Young Station, but would not have provided any relief north of Blue Young Station. The Ontario line provides some relief. So, but what, what would that do to the extended life for, for Blue Young? Uh, be, because uh, the pattern of ridership on line one shifts and changes, particularly with the line one uh, extension, uh, the peak point on line one shifts from where it is today, south of Blue Young Station, to north of Blue Young Station. And okay. so, as a result, uh, the relief line or the Ontario line, while it helps south of Blue Young Station, does not solve the peak point the problem in the future. Similar issues north that the extended relief line would. Correct. Okay. Um, how many buses do we have? How many buses? Yeah, we well, have? how many buses in our fleet? We, we operate, we own a, oh, more than 2,000 buses and we operate uh, about 1,700 buses every 1,700 year. buses. At any given day, what's the rate of buses that are out, out on the streets? delivering service. So we, we schedule about uh, 1,660 buses in the morning rush hour. That's we got 40 buses to spare. At no, no we, own, we own about 2,000 buses. So we have about a 12% spares ratio of buses. And is that a good ratio? Yes. Could you do any better? Could uh, you get it down to five? No, absolutely not. So how many buses, if the SRT goes down today, how many buses do we need to keep that line running at the current capacity? So our, our, our through the chair, our, our sketch plans for a, a medium to long-term replacement of line three call for the use of between 50 and 60 buses in service or 60 to 70 buses in total in order to provide a appropriate capacity uh, between Scarborough Centre Station and Kennedy Station. That's not leaving a lot of wiggle room. We would need, probably need more buses to accommodate that. Uh, a medium to long term addition of that number of buses, yes, uh, requires uh, additional fleet and also probably requires some additional maintenance facilities. Additional maintenance facilities and fleet. What's, a limiting, what's the limiting agent in how big our bus fleet can be? Would you say it's, it's, it's money to buy new buses or maintenance facilities? Uh, through the chair, the, the limiting ability of the TTC to operate buses is having sufficient garages or maintenance capacity in order to house and service those buses. Just, um, ju just very quickly. Um, on the financing, so if the province takes onto their books the Ontario line and the three uh, and the three stop, what does that leave us in cash? What do we have sitting there? People are talking about a five billion dollar number, but what is it? What do we have in the in the account? So, <clears throat> presently, uh, council has in fact fully funded the Scarborough East extension at uh, about 1.2 billion dollars. It's done so so through a development charge. Uh, bylaw, uh, as well as a dedicated levy. So it in fact frees up $1.2 billion. We have $1.2 in the bank. Correct. Um, 
the, uh, the, the city building fund. If we were to increase the city building fund by 1%, what does that do to our capital spending capacity? A 1% increase to the city building fund. So a city building fund yields approximately $31 million annually, which could leverage approximately $640 million in debt. Okay. And then one last question. Can you tell me a jurisdiction where design bid build, like the scenario being discussed here, has come on time and on budget? Okay, that was your last question. Okay, thank you. Recess to 2 o'clock.